to me. F five weeks exactly as of yesterday. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay so really it's like any time now. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, he's ready. He's uh <laughs> and so is Lynette. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Uh, it'll be around the corner before you know it, Jamie. Oh uh, yeah. Can't wait. And at least she doesn't have to suffer through in August. Yeah, that's what I keep telling her. I'm like, hey, at least it's like right before the summertime. So it's a good way to think of it. Just one little word of advice from one father to a prospective one. You, you're going to want to tread lightly on all of that. Uh, hey, this isn't that bad thing. This. Oh, no, my, my mouth is dead. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I'll, what, have what you <laughs> I'll have to second that one. Yeah. I think your best phrase might be, how can I help you? Yeah, yep. <laughs> what do you need? Oh, don't ask. Just figure it out and do it right away. <laughs> That's better yet. <laughs> oh, I better silence my phone. There we go. I see Zavi there, Amanda, or Amber, sorry. Hi, Zavi. Hey, everyone. I love it. Happy, Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. Amanda. Hey, Amanda. It, oh, right. It was Saturday. It was last week. It was well, it was last Wednesday. It was smack in the middle of the week. So okay. Happy belated. Thanks. If anyone asks, I'm 32. Okay. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I don't think I can rock 32 though. I'm sticking to 45. Yeah, I haven't gone past 50. She'll be with us pretty soon.
Hey, so has anybody reached out to uh, council president? I'm doing that now. Okay, thanks. He texted me earlier, he was running a little late, so I'm waiting to hear from him. Okay. Wait a few more minutes and then I'll go ahead and start the meeting there. Okay, in the meantime, has did anybody watch the NCAA women's basketball game last night? I'm not a huge basketball fan, but I love when women's sports hits a national stage and the stories behind the coaches it was really interesting. So Patrick, did you watch? I did not watch it, but I'll say that women's basketball is so much better because it's <laughs> actual skill passing defense. Like it's okay. more real basketball. <laughs> All right. Way. So I was the only one. Oh, I haven't heard back from council president. So I'm going to go ahead and start the meeting if that's okay with everybody. Bernie, I'd like to bring uh, the April 5th uh, uh, committee meeting to order. Can we have a roll of members, please? Yes, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Royo. Here. Ms. Baker. Here. Ms. Craig. Here. Ms. Diaz? Here. Mr. Garcia Molina? Here. Mr. Soto? Here. And President Smith Waydell. Uh, everyone being here, wait, we have uh, approval of the March 1st, uh, 2021 committee uh, meetings, please. I have a motion. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Vote on those minutes. Mr. Royo. Aye. Ms. Baker? Aye. Ms. Craig? Aye. Ms. Diaz? Aye. Mr. Garcia Molina? Aye. And Mr. Soto? Aye. Uh, next item. So we move to personnel committee. Uh, Ms. Diaz. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Councilman uh, Soto, we have a nomination of Michael Alwyn for the Planning Commission as an alternate, and I do believe that he is here to speak. Yep. Michaela Alwyn is in the uh, waiting room. Hello, it's Michaela. <laughs> Hi, Michaela. Would you Hi. like to address uh, City Council and give us a little um, information about yourself and being on the, you know, on the board? Sure. Yeah, I look forward to um, this appointment. I um, am a six-year resident of Lancaster City recently to the west side of the city. Um, my background is in architecture and community development. Um, I currently work at the Lancaster County Redevelopment Authority as the housing programs manager, uh, leading affordable housing development uh, throughout the county. 
So thank you for your consideration. Do we have any questions from the personnel committee? Councilor Diaz, just a comment for Michaela, and thank you for joining us here this evening. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased that we've been able to, um, to fill the seats and alternative member seats in the Planning Commission. And Michaela, I think your experience working with the Redevelopment Authority uh, makes you uniquely, uniquely qualified um, uh, to, to serve in this role. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Diaz, I do have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Michaela. Thank you so much um, for being so willing to do this on your off time as well. It shows how much you really care about community. And I was seeing here that you have experience with the Land Bank Authority at the county level. Um, and while I had you, I kind of wanted to see if you had any kind of perspective as to opportunities that we had in the city for our Land Bank Authority, if you've had the chance to get to know the work that we've been doing there. Yeah, sure. I've actually met um, pretty in depth with Emma Hum recently as she's been taking over the land bank. Um, we, we have talked about many opportunities to collaborate on that front. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share all of our documentation. We have about a three year history of, um, of, of, you know, remediating blight throughout the county uh, at this point. And we've done around uh, 10 plus projects, both residential and mixed use. So I'm very happy to, to collaborate and at any point with Emma. Um, and I you know, wanna continue that work as she you know, grows into her position. So yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that and, and excited to do that kind of work. That's probably my, um, the, my most exciting part of my job is managing the land bank for the county. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and the only other question that I do have, and just because we have a lot of people coming on for the planning commission today is mm -hmm. when it comes to racial equity mm -hmm. in the planning sphere, like mm -hmm. what is your opinion on how we can be doing better in our community <laughs> on that work? Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think um, to be candid, like the history of not in not addressing racial equity and not even speaking about it is obviously where to start. So I think that we can start at a very basic level um, by making sure that it's even part of the conversation, whereas it hasn't been in basically any of the fields that I have uh, experience in architecture, uh, community development, planning, capacity building on a community neighborhood level. So honestly, I, I think that we're kind of at the place where it just even needs to be part of the conversation to get it started and have a really honest conversation as well. I'd like to turn the meeting over to Council President Smith Waddell, who is president at the time. Council President. Thank you, Councilor Soto, um, and uh, thank you, uh, Michaela. Um, I am here, um, and sorry for interrupting. I am going to turn the meeting back to Councilor Diaz. Um, while we're at that, any other council members would like to address uh, Mrs. Olin? If not, then I guess um, any questions from the public? No questions? We do have a hand raised. Okay. Hello. Tony Dastra, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. Just one question. I apologize, I'm out of breath from running around the park with my dog. Uh, to our candidate, what is your view on how the proposed construction of 147 unit luxury high rise will have on our ability to create affordable housing in the city of Lancaster? I do recognize investment in housing as an important part of building our community, but I definitely have concerns about putting such concentrated value in one location. So, especially having experience on the county level and redevelopment, I would like to hear your opinion. Oh, here's a parking ticket sitting on the ground. Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion of how this high rise might affect the city's capacity to build affordable housing. Thank you. Mr. Dastra, um, if, I, if I may interject, um, and Michaela, so as not to put you in a, in a difficult position, Mr. Dastra, for, for 
legal reasons, and most importantly, um, I would say it might be a more fruitful question to ask uh, Michaela how she might approach um, a question. I think we get into sort of a tough place when we ask people how they would evaluate something or how they would vote or opine on something um, that they are uh, th they will later eventually uh, possibly evaluate. So I think if we can frame this in the the, the space of like what's the what's the question? What tools would you use? Uh, to evaluate it instead of saying like, hey, what's what's your opinion on a specific vote? I know that sounds like hair splitting, but I think that's going to put all of us in a better place moving forward. Does that does that make sense to you, Michaela? Yeah, I was I was going to say you're throwing me some some deep ones right off the bat here, but that's good. <laughs> and if I could also just interject, Michaela, this is uh, Mayor Sirachi, uh, is to also just say that uh, and this is more of a point of order uh, to President Smith Waydell. Uh, if it is the intention of Mr. Dastra to ask all five of our planning commission members their position and how they would approach this, I would just uh, yield to our long agenda this evening. Thank you. Ten four. Um, that being said, that is uh, just advice on my part about how the question might be best framed and responded. Um, it is not my committee meeting, so I apologize for interjecting, Councilor Diaz, please carry on. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I can give a quick perspective just in, in, a, in you know, the caution of time. I, I, would, um, I would encourage everyone um, to kind of learn about the process of what it takes to construct an affordable housing community. Um, and that's both on the new construction side and the preservation side. So I'll, I'll just put that out there. Uh, I, I won't necessarily comment on this specific, um, you know, new development. I feel, you know, it, um, investment in the city is always positive. Um, in, in, but, you know, I, I would suggest, you know, learning, learning about the process of affordable housing construction, learning about what goes into it, learning about how many partners are needed and what kind of investment, the timeline. Um, et cetera. So I, I encourage you. Um, I appreciate that feedback. I actually to, am know. making these comments because I quit working in property development because I disagreed with my employer. Uh, I do know a little bit. I appreciate what you're putting down, um, but your response is all I needed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, if there is no other questions, I would like to, um, well, the motion's on the table. So if I can get... So I'd like to then move this to full council for next Tuesday. Um, all in favor? Aye. Thank you, Mrs. Alwyn. Have a good evening. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. And I will move forward then to make the motion for David Boom um, Planning Commission alternative. If I'm not sure, I think he is on here. So if he would like to come in and address city council. Sorry, what was that name? Bohm, David Bohm, B-O. I do see him about halfway down the list. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I added him. See him? I don't see him. <laughs> um, try to add him, let's try that again. Nope, that was the wrong person. Sorry, having some trouble. Don't know what's going on. <laughs> uh. Let's see. I don't see them anymore in the waiting room. You don't? I think they're in the Zoom liminal oh, space. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's what I added him and he didn't, it didn't move over. So I clicked again and that's when it took him out and then it <laughs> bumped me down to someone else. And... Okay. Well then it- He's <laughs> back in the waiting room now. Doctor, back. Huh. There is no waiting room. The attendees list rather. I'm on the attendees list now. <clears throat> I again.
Hello, Ms. Bohm. Can you unmute yourself? David, David Boom. I feel like everything's yeah. lagging a little bit this evening. Hi. <laughs> I, I'm actually across right now as we speak on the way back from a trip for uh, over the weekend. So okay. I apologize if my signal is poor. Yes, um, I wanted to see if you can um, kind of give us a, a rundown on your um, your time that you're going to be spending with the Planning Commission if you wanted to address City Council. Absolutely. Um, I'm very excited and honored to be able to be nominated uh, for this role. Um, I have a master's degree in city planning uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, it's been a lot of time in different uh, areas of city planning earlier in my career and more recently I've been in data analysis for about seven years mm -hmm. currently working for LGH and healthcare data analysis so I'm hoping to bring a, a data perspective to the uh, city council I'm sorry for the planning commission great um, is there any questions then by any of the um, personnel committee just a clarifying question, Councillor Diaz. Um, Mr. Bohm is up for not an alternate, but a regular member. Is that right? Maybe Mr. Harris, can you double check that? No, he's on as an alternate member. It's a, it is an alternate. Okay, then I just, I copied it down wrong. Never mind. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from um, full council? Okay, so if there is no questions, then I'd like to go ahead and make that motion. Um, if somebody wants to second it. Second. And if everybody agrees, I'd like to move this then for um, full council next Tuesday. Aye. All in favor? There's also a question. I don't know if we need to legally take the questions from the audience. Oh, that's right. Do we have any questions from the... <laughs> from our um, constituents. It appears Mr. Dastra has a question. Mr. Dastra, do you wanna address Mr. Bohm? Hey, Mr. Bohm, how are you doing? Good, good. So I have a question for you. It's actually completely about myself because you see, I appreciate the fact that you have a master's in urban planning because I am, studying urban planning. I'm actively in a degree program and I am, uh, you know, I, I would have been honored as well to be selected as an alternate for this position. In fact, I applied. So I am jealous of you. I'm very jealous of you. Um, my question to you is what do you see as the value of public engagement, public participation, and how far should the city go in any given project? Uh, at what point does engaging the public become too much? <clears throat> uh, it becomes complicated based on the situation. Obviously, if you're making some minute rule changes or language updates to the, you know, some committee minutes or something, obviously you don't need very much public engagement. Um, so I think it's really dependent on the size and the scope of the issue being dealt with. Um, anything that's going to make any significant changes obviously needs to have significant feedback and that's just beyond you know soliciting opinions online or something but uh, if it's, there's something super major I mean you want to go out and actually seek those opinions with uh, in-person things when that's appropriate with COVID and also trying to just get opinions from different communities that are typically underserved or underheard in, in those situations so it really highly highly depends on uh, the situation. I agree. Would you say there's like a ballpark number that like, let's say someone wanted to do a redevelopment project. Um, sorry, I missed that, Bernie. I, I said we, you had a question and that question was answered. And we do. not this isn't really a forum for a back and forth on a personal level. Fair enough. All right. Thank you. Well, the motion was already um, put on the table. So if you're all in favor, Hi. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next nomination <clears throat> is Maxine Cook for the Planning Commission member. 
Is she, I don't know if she, if she is available to speak or if she's here, I don't see. I don't see Maxine. There is someone with their hand raised and I'm wondering if that's maybe Maxine, but I'm not sure. That's Dr. Frederick. Um, we can let her, let them in, I guess. Not sure. It's hard to say sometimes. Yeah. Hello, good evening. This is Maxine Cook. Can you hear me? Yes, Maxine. I apologize. I was doing some other work um, and I am on my AVP's Zoom, <laughs> but this is Maxine Cook. I couldn't tell if I was in here. I could see all of you and hear all of you, but good evening. My name is Maxine Cook. I'm here. Thank you. Well, Maxine, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself to the council and being part of the planning commission. Sure. Um, I am born and raised in Lancaster City. Um, I've lived on the northeast, northwest, southwest, and southeast end of town throughout <laughs> my life. Um, but for the most part, most of my um, life has been in the southeast end of town. Um, I've worked for 20, a little over 22 years in higher education in mm -hmm. Chester County at the oldest historically black college and university in the United States. Um, I'm an army veteran um, and I serve on the city planning committee and was recommended. Um, I was asked by Emma Ham of my interest in the commission and I uh, was elated to do so. Um, I love scanning maps and um, exploring resources in new towns. Like I look at a map, if I'm going to a new place, I wanna know where the police are, where the hospital is, where the parks are, uh, do they have mass transportation? So I'm a little, I'm a little map nerd kind of person, um, but being on the city planning committee has been very interesting and I'm hoping, um, to bring a community member perspective um, to the needs of the city and its people and to see if um, really does, does this process work? Does this process really work for the people? That's why I am elated to be here. Well, I'm very happy, Maxine. It's great to see some diversity. Um, in the planning commission, and I'm sure that you are going to be great. And I am going to ask anybody from the personnel committee if they have any questions really quick. No questions, but just really grateful to see your resume come through and all the work that you've done at Lincoln University. And I think the perspective that you're going to bring to the commission itself um, in addition to being map nerdy is going to be really beneficial for us. So I appreciate you and your service. Thank you so much. Agreed, Councilor Garcia Molina. Any questions from full council? Um, no questions for me, but uh, Ms. Cook, were you referring to, uh, you're referring to Cheney University. Excuse me, no. Lincoln University Lincoln, is the oldest degree granting Yes. Historically Black College and University. When I first went to Lincoln, I had to clarify that myself. I knew there was this <laughs> long time rivalry, but I am very familiar now and proud to say Lincoln is the first degree granting HBCU. Well, I'm happy to be corrected and really looking forward to your participation on the Planning Commission. Thank you so much. So I will go ahead and see if anybody in the room has a question. Any of my constituency. So since we do not have any questions, then we'll like to. Okay. Wait, you guys hear me? Yep, go ahead, Tony. Hi, Ms. Cook. Thank you for being willing on serving on this commission. Uh, I appreciate it, especially you having perspective from all four quadrants of the city. Right. I think that's very much needed. My thank question you. to you is, oh, you're welcome. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, my question is, if somebody came forward with a project to you, uh, what percentage of a given project would you expect to be put forward towards talking to members of the public, like gathering public opinion, like just throwing a number out there. If someone said they wanted to spend a million dollars in the city on a redevelopment project, 
Uh, how much of that budget would you anticipate is geared towards getting the public's opinion, making sure all four quadrants are he heard, uh, and so on? Well, I would say that that would probably, if I'm given a project and it's a million dollars to approach the city and there's four quadrants, I would say every quadrant need to be, would need to be assessed and heard and then monies appropriated according to the needs of that particular part of the community. All right. So basically, just looking at our community and saying, how much do we need to invest to make sure everyone from this area is heard properly? That's what she said. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Great. I love it. Thank you very yeah. much. You're welcome. Well, um, then I would like to go ahead and make that motion. Second. And if everybody agrees in personnel committee to move this to next Tuesday to full council. Aye. Aye. And I really want to thank you, madam, for coming and speaking and hope to see some great um, planning and maps to see how <laughs> the city is. <laughs> thank you all. It's a pleasure to see you all and hopefully to get to work with you all in this important work. Have a good evening. You also take care. Thank you. <clears throat> Next in line for nomination is Miriam Ortega Brown for the uh, Planning Commission. Um, is she available? And if she is, can we bring her in? Uh, yes, she is on her way in. Yes, I am. I'm present. Hi, Miriam. How are you? Hello. Hi, Jen. How are you, lady? I'm good. <laughs> so um, if you'd like, you can address the committee and tell us about yourself. All right. Good evening, um, Mayor, Council Members. I'm very much honored to be selected to fill in for the rest of the term for Eve as a replacement. And I'm hoping that I'll love it enough that I'll stay on for another four years. Um, <laughs> I'm very um, just honored that to represent my area, the west of the city, known as West Lancaster Jewels. We've been around for about four years with the help of the mayor and um, just members of the area, citizens of the area, just wanting more representation within the city or just to be seen and be heard. Um, I'm new to the whole city planning thing, so this is going to be a whole new ball game for me. <laughs> I'm a reading literacy specialist with Carter McCray. I've been there for the last three years. I've been at Lincoln Middle School for six years prior to that. I'm a Millersville University alumnus. Um, a New Jersey transplant. I've been here about 40 years. My family's been here over 60. My dad's side of the family's been here 65 plus years. So I've been invested in this um, this part, neck of the woods, this southeast part of the city for quite some time. I've grown up here. I'm just eager to learn and eager to grow. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, I know you do a lot of work in the uh, West Joel area and I know how you guys, I'm always out there with you guys, <laughs> with the kids and Halloween and, and enjoying that um, ability to, um, you know, have a good relationship with the community. So um, I would like to know if anybody in personnel would like to address um, Ms. Ortega. Yes, please, Councilor Diaz. Hello, Ms. Ortega. Thank you so Hi, much sir. for being here. Um, I just wanted to, to say, you know, you mentioned that you don't necessarily have specific planning experience, and that is certainly not a prerequisite uh, for this position. Your involvement in the community um, and your sincere desire to, to do what's best for the community is exactly what we're looking for. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to have you here tonight uh, to, to come in and potentially fill this opening that we have on the commission. Um, you know, we have, we need people with all different types of backgrounds and experiences, and you don't need a master's in, in city planning uh, to do this, this role. And so I'm, I'm really pleased that you're here um, and your willingness to serve. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Amanda. I also second that. I don't have any city council experience and I think I'm doing <laughs> all right. So I have full faith that your experience and community work is gonna set you up for success. Good to hear. Thank you, Savior. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from full council? 
And I am going to ask if we have any questions from our constituents. Hi, Miriam. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Is this Tony? This is Tony. <laughs> Tony, no hard questions. <laughs> no hard questions. You know, I actually have a pretty easy question uh, because yeah. I agree that community involvement and just being a part of the community is one of the biggest things we can do to just Definitely. take a part in the planning process. Definitely. So planning commission, to my knowledge, it is put on Zoom, but it's not recorded and saved on YouTube like the city council committee meetings and city council meetings are. If you're on planning commission, is that something you'd push for, making sure that we can watch these meetings recorded? Uh, yes, I think transparency is what everybody wants these days. They want to know what's going on behind the closed doors. So, yeah, I would probably be for that. Love it. Then I'm for you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> So, um, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam. Um, I'm very happy to have you on board and to see some more diversity, especial las Latinos y las Latinas. Um, but with that, I'd like to, um, we have the motion on the table. Second. And if everyone is in favor, I'd like to move that then to next Tuesday for full council. Aye. Great. Thank you so much, Miriam. Have a good evening. Buenas noches. So we go ahead then and move to, let's see. Mr. Mr. Um, Sufert, is that correct? Sufert, Sufert. Is he available? Nicole. How do you say it? I think it's Nicole. I think. It's oh, the last name. Oh, no, no. First name, Nicole. No, I know that, but the last. Oh. Super so, sounds about first, I think. right. Yeah, yeah it's super. Second. Double check. <laughs> okay. Is Nicole super available? Um, she can address us. I don't know. Hi. Hello, good everybody. Evening. Good afternoon. Or I, I guess I should say good evening now. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it is a, um, I'll just jump right in here. I'm Nicole. I have been a city resident for about 15 or so years now. My husband and I have uh, two proud SDOL children. One's in Wharton and one's in Reynolds Middle School, soon to both be in Reynolds Middle School next year. I, um, I'm a marketing professional and I have spent my entire career in the um, architects, engineer and construction industry. Um, so I, uh, I don't have sp trade specific um, information uh, to apply to the role, but I do have um, the big picture overarching perspective of how these um, systems work together from how a project um, comes about from the economic standpoint to the constructability aspect of it. Um, my passions lie within, you know, smart building and sustainable growth. Um, and sustainable growth means not only from an economic perspective, but also from like a long-term endurance perspective. You know, are the dollars we're, we're investing now, are they, are they long-term? Um, is this just a quick fix? Because if that's what it is, that's not what's best for me or my children or my children's children. Um, and then aside from that, you know, this, this, uh, this, this city or this position right here is such an honor to be sitting on because I have thought about this and dreamed about this opportunity for, for a number of years now. Um, when I think about what, what jazzes me up and what's exciting about volunteering and, and dedicating my time outside of my family. Um, you know, and, and I've served on the Lancaster Chamber, um, the board, and I've been um, a volunteer with the economic development um, of Lancaster and, and this just seems like a perfect spot. So I'm super pumped to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mrs. Super. Um, is anybody in the personnel committee would like to ask any questions? No, just super grateful for your involvement. And just like we said to the individual beforehand, I think having that technical experience isn't always like the most important part. Uh, the fact that you're a parent, the fact that you've been here 15 years, you have that holistic perspective, it's all going to come together. And I'm just really grateful to have you on board. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be here too. I mean, just the whole, the, to see the city, how it has grown and evolved over the last 15 mm -hmm. years. I mean, 
um, you know, we came back from Philadelphia this weekend. And as soon as we were coming down um, Walnut Street, you know, I smiled because that green strip of bike lanes, like I love the attention that that grabs and, you know, bikeability, walkability, all of that stuff is very important. And, and that's all part of smart planning. So. And now you'll potentially get to be a part of it. I know, which is even better. <laughs> Any questions from full council? Any questions from our constituents? <laughs> Go ahead, Tony. <laughs> Hi. So as I was listening, I appreciate uh, your experience in the field. Uh, and I appreciate knowing that you have a marketing background. As strange as this may sound, as you were talking, I couldn't help but thinking help but think of a song so my question to you is half poetic and half very gravely serious uh how much does a dollar cost how much does a dollar cost i mean i guess it depends well so a wise man once told me you you measure what you have not by how much money you have by the by the wealth that's true excuse me it's you measure your wealth by what you have when the money's all gone right so to me, a dollar could be worth really a whole lot of nothing, um, depending on, on what it is. So I, a dollar invested wisely is a dollar well spent. Um, sometimes you spend a dollar on something that you probably shouldn't just because it's an impulse and, and a moment decision. I like that answer. Thank you very much for your honest response. Thank you, Tony. I was thinking about the stock market and how our dollar is dropping over overseas, but okay. <laughs> um, then I'd like to go ahead and make a motion if there is no other questions um, for Mrs. Sulfur to the Planning Commission. Um, Second. And go ahead and move it forward to full council then uh, next Tuesday. Aye. All Aye. Okay. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sulfur. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. You too. And um, I guess that's, is that all we have for personnel? I think that's all we have. Hallelujah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, move it forward to uh, the President Wydell. Thank you, Councillor Diaz. And thank you, Michaela, David, Maxine, Miriam, and, uh, and Nicole. Um, all right. I believe that brings us to the Community Planning Committee. Councilor Craig, take it away. Thank you, Council President. Um, community planning is now called to order. Um, the first item on our agenda is um, Administration Resolution 22, Community Development Block Grant for five-year uh, consolidated plan and annual plan presentation. I am not 100% sure who's here to present that, but I see That'll be Chris. Chris. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Hello. Good evening, counselors. How are you? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. good. I'm anxious to hear about this. Yes. Uh, before I get started, just want to say a quick uh, thank you to our new crop of planning commissioners. Very, very exciting to see them uh, join the group. All right, well, I have a short presentation uh, for you today uh, that's a summary of the consolidated plan work that has been happening uh, within the department, uh, getting ready to fulfill our requirement for the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. I'm actually filling in for Susanna Thorson um, tonight. She's our senior uh, development, uh, community development administrator, and she just had her first child on March 23rd. So she is out on maternity leave now. Congratulations to her. Yes. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> and I, she did such an amazing job getting this huge effort all the way to the finish line um, and just missed giving the presentation. So I'm, I'm gonna take over here and get to carry it across the finish line. Um, all right, uh, bear with me for a moment, please. Whoops, uh, Amber, it says that I can't share screen. Um, I will fix that. Um, all right, you should be good. Okay, try this again. Okay, we're gonna go to slideshow. 
Okay. Are we in good shape? Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Um, well, our subject here uh, tonight is our community development program, which uh, for our purposes this evening is really focused on uh, two sources of funding, the community development block grant and the emergency solution grant funds. And uh, as I mentioned at the top of, um, of this segment, uh, we are required to do this by uh, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, each year. Each year. Okay, just for the record, wanted to say uh, why we are here tonight. This is our official public meeting, April 5th, 2021, uh, for this HUD process and for the creation of these HUD documents. Uh, we're really presenting uh, two or three documents tonight, depending on how you look at it. Uh, the first is called the CAPER, which is an acronym that stands for Evaluation Report Over the Last uh, Five-Year Period from 2016 to 2020. We'll also be presenting the highlights from the consolidated plan for 2021 uh, through 2025. This is actually combined with the 2021 action plan because we're on the five the five year cycle um, for the consolidated plan. That means we actually do the consolidated plan and the action plan together this year. Um, also just wanted to be clear that we are using this meeting tonight to notify the council and the public that the draft documents have been posted. Uh, they, the draft documents were posted on uh, Engage Lancaster, our online platform. It's also on the Community Development Division uh, page of our city website as well. So these draft documents have been posted and there is an official citizen comment period that lasts through April 26th. I know that this is not the first rodeo for many of you. Uh, last year, we did talk about CDBG and ESG, uh, Community Development Block Grant and Emergency Solutions Grant funding. Uh, last year, in part because of the CARES Act funding that came uh, through the city. So this may be a reminder for, for many of you, but I also recognize there may be uh, others in the audience, in the public who haven't seen this yet. Uh, this is a graphic that Susanna created actually, which I like a lot. Uh, it shows what are the main, uh, main purposes for community development block grant funding. It, uh, you may have heard in the past that CDBG tends to be one of our most flexible sources of federal funding, which is true, but it also comes with very strict rules and regulations related to that funding. Um, the, the dollars overall are intended for low to moderate income community members. And you can see here uh, the main categories of uses, uh, everything from quality affordable housing to economic development. Next major grant category that we're talking about is emergency solutions grant. This tends to be more focused on homeless, uh, homeless needs and services. Uh, as you can see in the center of the chart there, it says it's intended for community members experiencing homelessness. So we're really looking at a continuum of uh, challenges. Here in the city, we have tended to use ESG money uh, primarily for homelessness prevention uh, and emergency shelter uh, work or operations in the past. Just a quick note here on process. As I mentioned earlier, this is an annual cycle that we go through each year and um, HUD, it, it varies the time of year that we get notice from HUD. It is usually in the first quarter that the city is notified of the financial allocation for the CDBG and the ESG programs. And then, as I mentioned earlier, each year the city must produce an action plan and uh, every five years a consolidated, uh, consolidated plan. The city has a pretty short window to fulfill these regulatory requirements. This year we got the notice on... Um, I think we received the letter on March 1st. It was dated at the end of February. We then have 60 days to do everything that we need to do. Put the plan together, um, post the plan for a 30 day comment period, and then ultimately uh, have a resolution from council and submit the whole package back to HUD. So it's a very, very tight timeline. And this is uh, one of the reasons why I appreciate how hard Susanna worked uh, to get this all ready to go. Our, our submission to council, I'm sorry, our submission to HUD is due on April 29th this year. 
And so this will be back before the council for a vote on April 27th. First, we'll start with a couple slides about the last five years, our evaluation report for 2016 to 2020. I think this is a really interesting bar chart here that Susanna put together. It shows where our federal funding for CDBG and ESG went over the last five years. And you can see here that in red, uh, the red color um, was the largest proportion of that funding each year went to maintaining affordable housing. And you can see, you can see it varied over those five years. Also in yellow, providing a su suitable living environment. That is a that's a HUD phrase for a particular category, uh, work category. We This really represented uh, street and public space improvements for the most part. Expand economic opportunities in green. You can't really see it, but there was like a very small sliver in each of the years. And then it went up in 2020 because we used more uh, funding, CDBG funding in uh, 2020 for um, technical assistance to small businesses during the pandemic. And then finally, all of our ESG dollars went to home, homeless services during uh, those five years. Here's a summary of accomplishments that uh, we were able to um, achieve during that five-year period. This does not uh, capture everything, but these are some of the highlights that are reflected in the formal document that has been posted online. Regarding the maintain, maintaining affordable housing, we were able to provide critical repair and lead remediation services to 189 households. We assisted 441 households with tenant landlord mediation and tenant rights. Uh, we also inspected and ensured housing standards uh, for the 20,000 plus rental units throughout the city. With respect to the suitable living environment. I'd mentioned this was primarily street improvements. You can see here 129 city blocks. It also, um, this funding also paid for our uh, street operations group detail within the police department. And it also funded uh, 87 um, acquisitions of 87 properties that we uh, rehabbed through, uh, re primarily through RACL, the Redevelopment Authority. As you can see here, we also under expand economic opp opportunities. We sponsored 22 micro enterprises and created 45 jobs. And ultimately in this last category for homeless services, we assisted 1,082 households with rental assistance funding and also uh, were able to assist 825 homeless individuals uh, at overnight shelters over the course of that five years. Okay, that was looking backward the last five years. Now we're gonna look ahead for the next five years. We received our notice from HUD this year, uh, as I said, on uh, March 1st, at the end of February, March 1st. And our allocation was about what we expected it to be. And this is in line with the annual funding amount that we have gotten over the last several years, it adds up to about 1.6, a little over 1.6 million for CDBG and $142,000 annually uh, for ESG. If you multiply this over the five years, that means that we're talking about $8.4 million, almost $8.4 million uh, of CDBG money uh, for the fi next five years and $710,000 of ESG money over the next five years. This is in Engage Lancaster. I, I hope that uh, the counselors and members of the public have checked this out and have used it for a number of our initiatives so far. This has really been uh, groundbreaking in terms of getting more input into a variety of our initiatives. Typically in the past, when we had solicited input for the consolidated plan process, we would usually get a few comments at best. This year, we got 322 responses uh, to a community priorities poll about, um, about what the community was most interested in spending uh, this funding on over the five years. So this is, we've got some really exciting data. We had, the survey poll had many questions, but I rolled that up into 
um, a few categories here. So you can take a look at what are the uh, top priorities that we heard from, from the community. And as you can see here, 47% uh, of the respondents said that housing needs were their top priority. Homelessness needs 24%, public services needs 16%, and ultimately um, investments in community spaces, uh, public assets, that type of thing, uh, yielded 13% uh, as the highest uh, priority. In addition to that community survey poll that we did on our online platform, also wanted to explain that this is, the consolidated plan is part and parcel of the work that the department does on a regular basis. So we have had many meetings with experts uh, within city government and, um, uh, excuse me, outside city government and with our community partners and organizations since last year. And then we had a formal project planning team set up from January uh, through March to help make decisions about how to allocate the funding for the next five years. And this is where we landed. We still have our largest category as maintain affordable, good quality housing. This is almost $3.6 million over the five years. Um, as we've talked about in the past, this funding goes to a number of different programs, uh, including uh, our housing code enforcement. And in fact, I'll, I'll get into a little more detail in the next slide, but just want to go through these categories um, at, a, at a general level first. So 3.5 million, 3.6 million for maintain affordable, good quality housing. We assigned 1.9 million for increasing affordable housing opportunities, which is a new category for us this year. And then in gray, promote neighborhood quality of life. There's actually two co components to this and I'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, again, in yellow, expand economic opportunities and then in light blue, the homeless services. That, that's the entirety of our emergency solutions grant funding, the $728,000. This is a table that shows the uh, pie chart in a slightly different format and with a little bit more detail thought it would be a good way for us to dig into a few of these categories and uh, be a segue for any questions that that council or public might have. Um, as I started to explain, explain a moment ago, uh, the maintain affordable, good quality housing, a big chunk of that money does go to um, the, the salaries of our housing code enforcement staff that um, is working 24 hours a day, um, usually five or six days a week over the course of the year to make sure that our rental units are um, at the right standard. In addition to the housing code enforcement, we also use CDBG as a way to match our, it's a required match for our lead remediation grant, uh, which is a different source of funding. We've also used uh, CDBG for um, housing rehabilitation projects, uh, critical repair, and uh, those types of programs. These programs are very well established. They've been doing well over the last several years and we wanna make sure that we continue to invest in them. Increasing affordable housing. Uh, this is an area, uh, it's interesting. Uh, someone had asked Ms. Uh, Michaela Alwine a question uh, earlier uh, during the planning commission uh, personnel section of the meeting. And uh, she mentioned that the County Redevelopment Authority works on a number of things that we do in the city as well. The County Redevelopment Authority has done a good job using some of their CDBG funding to help complement uh, new development and find new housing opportunities in, in new development. So that, that's an area that we really want to dig into more. We've had a tremendous success over the last year or two in terms of the number of affordable housing units that we've been in, able to incorporate into new development. Um, but most of that has been done through the home funding and we're gonna be looking at uh, opportunities to use CDBG for that as well. The promote neighborhood quality of life uh, item uh, or priority it, uh, is really split into two pieces here. The first is funding that would be available for community assets such as streets and public facilities. I will note that 
the amount of funding that is allocated here is a is smaller percentage than what it had been in the past. We've used a lot of money for street improvements in the past, and we're really going to be shifting as much of that as possible to housing needs, because that's what we're seeing as the top priority in our community. Also, in Promote Neighborhood Quality of Life, we get a small um, we have a small amount of money that we are able to use for public services. And we are planning to use that money uh, for our health, health and housing social worker, uh, for our police social worker, and for neighborhood engagement as well. Once you get to that cap that you can use for public services, uh, then, then you're done. Uh, that's the ceiling and uh, you have to spend on other things that tend to be um, more like bricks and sticks and investment. Expand op economic opportunities will be following the blueprint that we've used in the past, which is funding uh, for, for programming that supports our local businesses. And this has in the past primarily been through uh, contracts and partnerships with assets to uh, help small and disadvantaged businesses with a, a variety of technical assistance. And then finally, um, support homeless services. And I'd mentioned this in, in the past slide as well, that we'll be using uh, ESG for all, el all eligible uses um, with a focus on homelessness prevention and uh, homeless shelter. Homeless shelter services and rapid rehousing, pardon me. So that that is uh, the consolidated plan in a nutshell. The document that is posted online is about a hundred page document and it is, um, in a required HUD structure. So unfortunately it's not the most user-friendly document. That is one of the reasons why we built the platform online uh, on Engage Lancaster uh, to try to highlight some of these important pieces of the puzzle. And, but ultimately you're welcome to comment on either the Engage Lancaster platform, or if you would like to read the document and write us a note, uh, write us an email or contact us in some way, uh, we'll take comments that way as well. So that, that's it for the formal presentation here, um, but I am happy to answer any questions that you might have about the program going ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, Chris. Um, I do have a question. The, um, the, promote, the section for promote neighborhood quality of life, would, would that include the um, mobile hygiene unit? Um, Director well, Dels, can I can I take this one? Sure. Hi. Hey, Councillor Craig. Uh, so the mobile hygiene unit is uh, is actually my my baby um, at at work, um, and so this is like a, actually a, a dovetail. If you don't mind me stealing a little bit of your thunder, um, we're we're hoping to to roll out um, in uh, in May. It certainly falls under the uh, promote neighborhood quality of life and the homelessness coalition uh, does see support in a variety of ways uh, from the city of Lancaster. I do not believe that project is directly linked to this funding stream. However, the city has been uh, and will be supportive of it in, in other ways. Does that answer your question, uh, Councillor Craig? Got it. Thank you. Yes, it does. Yes, yeah. it does. And um, Councilor Craig, I, thank you. I know you've been serving with us on a number of our committees related to this funding and have um, really been a huge asset uh, in that context. So thank you for your service there. I, the, last, um, the last concept that we had heard about the mobile unit, I think was actually applied, was applying for emergency solutions grant money as right. opposed to CDBG, but, but yes, it is in this uh, same program program that we're talking about here. Okay. All right. That is the only question that I have for the moment. Um, are there any questions, any other questions from the committee? If you I have a question, question. Councilor Craig. Go right ahead, Xavier. Well, first of all, thanks to you and Susanna uh, for all the work that went into this. Um, and I guess many questions to come, but the first one that I have, because this is a question that I had last year, is from the millions and millions of dollars that we've put into the community, 
uh, we still have put zero dollars into trans lives. Uh, like we keep reporting zero. And, and compared to other communities, like other around us are reporting that they actually are assisting trans individuals, but we keep reporting zero. Uh, and I think that just kind of is unacceptable at this point. So from my perspective, it's what can the city do to ensure that as we give these dollars out, we're not getting the same results back. Uh, and I think in a similar way, it's also like when we talk about equity, when we look at the racial and ethnic makeup of where those dollars went, it's still not equitable. Uh, so over half of those did go to white individuals, whereas like that is not the, the direct representation of our community here is not 50% white. So what can we do as a city to ensure as we give those dollars, we're ensuring that the data that comes back is reflective of our values as a city. And Councillor, I do have a question. You had mentioned the zero dollars going to the trans community, and then you had cited the um, dollars invested in uh, by race and ethnicity. And I was just wondering which, uh, like which data that you were looking at. I want to make sure so that I'm thinking about I that. am looking at the 149 page report that okay. was uh, shared. So within there, it gives the racial and ethnic composition of families assisted. So looking at CBDG in combination with the ESG uh, and looking at white in addition to everyone else kind of in combined, it ends up being about half is white and then half is everyone else. Okay. And then for the gender makeup, that's always reported as zero for trans. Right. Okay. I understand the question. Um, I'm happy to dig into the data a little bit more. Um, HUD, HUD typically is gearing their funding toward ensuring that we are, in the case of CDBG, um, making sure that it is used for low to moderate income individuals within the community. So uh, the, the strict administrative regulations for the program require that you're reporting on, on that particularly. Mm -hmm. So it's really looking at um, income level more, more than anything else. But uh, I do think it's a very important question, not that we just understand what's happening over the last five years, but how can we be more intentional about that? My, my, my thinking in this regard is that the categories that we're talking about today are really like the, the broad uh, brush strokes for where we wanna put the money. But then usually when that money is allocated to specific organizations, we are doing uh, an RFP a request for proposals uh, that request funding that we then allocate or subcontract to organizations. So I think really it, we need to make sure that we're doing a good job in our outreach with the RFP um, process to, to those um, communities to make sure that they have an opportunity to access that funding and that we have that in mind when we're making a decision about the contracts that we, um, that we issue and the funding that we reallocate to our community. Because some of our, some of our dollars are going directly to city services, but a, a, a huge amount of the funding is also going out to community organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we have an, an opportunity to get at what you're talking about. And that's exactly, that's a, like, to me, it's where I'm like thinking of like, what can we do as a city, whether that's like increasing requirements from those that submit RFPs uh, to ensure that next year's data doesn't reflect that because that was kind of my hesitation and my kind of worries um, last year was that we would see these results um, and not that like we're not doing good work, not that the results don't show that we're doing good work, but it's showing that we aren't doing it with the intentionality, especially around gender identity, but also I think there's a lot of improvement to be done around racial equity and how those dollars are spent equitably. But yeah, so I think that is where I would want us to see about what the future of the RFP process looks like. Yeah, I think that's a great, I think that's a great suggestion. And um, I, I am sorry that uh, Susanna is not here because she is our data maven. So she knows this data inside and out. And I think she has really thought about um, how can we be more intentional with the contracts? And in fact, that's been a big part of our discussion related to the, the ESG funding that we're using um, for homelessness services is can we focus it not just on the same old blueprint, but are there specific needs that we're seeing right now 
that we can shape an RFP in a way that we're getting at that specific need. Thanks. Are there any other questions from the committee? Uh, if I may, Councillor Craig? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Director Dels, for the presentation. Um, I found it very helpful to see the um, where the dollars are going as far as priorities. Um, is there a way, and I'm looking forward to digging into the uh, the report, but is there, um, are we able to see where geographically uh, in the city the dollars are going into? Yes, there are a series of maps in the larger document that shows where um, where the programs have spent money over the last five years. And that's actually a big part of what HUD is tracking is HUD often uses service areas or census areas to ensure that we're spending money um, on low to moderate income households. And so you will see a series of maps in there, but if, if you're uh, looking for something that you can't find, let me know and we, we may have it. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions from council as a whole? Councillor Craig, um, I, I do have something. Go ahead, Councillor McKay. Uh, Dallas, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering, uh, so we're, looks like we, we're pivoting some funds into the actual creation uh, or construction or reconstruction of affordable housing, which is fantastic. And I'm wondering at this earlier, early stage in the game, do we know exactly how those decisions may be made if there will be an application process, will that be put out to a third party? Do we know what that might look like? That's relatively new for us. Uh, yes, thank you for the question, Councillor Beke. I We've been talking about this within the department and I do think it will be an RFP process. That's the most likely um, and most tried and true process that we've used in the past. And it gets back to what we were saying before about just making sure that um, there is clear outreach and communication so that we don't miss a good project. Um, there were actually a couple that I just learned of last year that um, there were opportunities for affordable housing units and we just didn't know about them. That doesn't mean they can't apply ahead, going ahead, but um, that that's the way we're envisioning it at this point. Yeah, certainly because they, um, they wanna have funding in place ahead of time and not on the back end. Usually. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just to follow up to that, um, Councillor Bake, it's uh, our home process. Uh, our, the federal dollars we receive uh, from home funding, which you know we just made those announcements uh, a few weeks ago, did go through a similar RFP process. And so I think that that's going to be replicated in this way, even though using CDBG dollars in that way is something new. I do want to see how those uh, efforts can be aligned because right now we're still talking about relatively small pots. Of funding between home and CDBG dollars. At the same time, you know, all eyes are on what the Treasury Secretary is going to be releasing in the next couple of weeks related to affordable housing and also on um, the infrastructure bill that is being uh, discussed uh, in Washington, D.C., which uh, which includes uh, a tremendous uh, investment in existing uh, low income uh, properties uh, that are throughout the country to reinvest in those as well as new affordable. And so what, what this gives us an opportunity to do is to continue to hone our criteria and to develop programs that can be scalable as we uh, hopefully have more funding available. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council as a whole? Councillor Craig, may I? Take it away. Um, uh, this one is actually for the, I think mostly for the benefit of the public, Director Delfs. Um, but uh, I know that an object of concern, uh, especially for the past four years in council is as we step up our efforts um, on the quality portion or the, the safe portion of the safe quality affordable housing um, and we step up inspection uh, efforts. Um, I think we all know that occasionally that results in um, uh, an apartment or home being declared uh, no longer habitable for one reason or, or another. Um, and there have been a number of efforts, frankly, that have flown under the radar uh, by city staff uh, to ensure that persons displaced in that way 
uh, have temporary and permanent housing um, accommodations. And I think that that's, uh, first of all, I wanna say, I think that that's very admirable. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how the housing social worker uh, may, may factor into that work uh, going forward? Because I think that that's something that, that both council and the public uh, needs, needs to hear about because I think it gives us the confidence that when we are you know, inspecting um, and demanding certain corrections to housing, that we are not displacing people uh, by trying to create a certain standard of quality. Yes, thank you. That, that's a great question. And that housing social worker pilot that we had last year, um, that housing social worker really tended to focus on issues that, that the housing inspector has found during their visits. And so they're, they often related to mental health, could be a hoarding issue, for example. And so that housing uh, social worker really served as that bridge or navigate uh, navigator to other social services through the county, et cetera. So that, that's one area that they've really focused. In the past year, um, we have not uh, really moved forward with many condemnations, um, as many that ha had happened in the past before the pandemic. But I do think um, if and when that happens moving ahead, I do believe the social worker is going to be really important in playing that role to, to make sure we're finding um, finding temporary accommodations for uh, someone who's been displaced in that type of situation. So I, I think your your question is spot on, and uh, it's something that we're really attuned to going ahead um, because we may see more of that. Thank you. May I? Go ahead, Councilor Diaz. Councilor Craig. Um, my question, you mentioned contractors. Can you give me an understanding about subcontractors and what exactly you're referring to? Uh, sure, Councilor Diaz. And yeah, sorry, this is like kind of gets into HUD lingo. When when we use the term like subrecipient or subcontractor, it's usually not like a general contractor the way we think of somebody, you know, renovating a house. It's usually a, um, a nonprofit organization a community partner that we are allocating the funding to. And then that community partner is using that pot of money to um, accomplish the various services or goals that they need. So a, a contractor, the contract in this case is typically between the city and a community organization. Okay. And the next question would be, what do you consider affordable housing? Well, the definition of affordable housing, we usually start with the notion that 30% of a household's income, anything that is spent beyond that is considered housing cost burdens. So that is usually where we start as a baseline. When we start to look at HUD programs and how those programs are applied, HUD is typically using a um, area median income, and then there's uh, there are amounts per household, per number of people in a household that are tied to that area median income. So affordable housing definition, it depends on what, what program or what segment of the population that you're talking about. Okay. And in regards to um, repairing um, or using some of the CVG dollars, are we going to invest in the towers that are on Chester Street or on um, Fordham, I think it's called, if I'm not mistaken? because I know that their infrastructure is not the best. Are, are you referring to the Lancaster City Housing Authority properties, Councilor? Uh, yes. Church Church Towers in Farnham, yeah. Farnham Street, yeah. So uh, at this, it, with it, with CDBG dollars uh, specifically, are, are you asking prospectively, are we planning to invest or have we invested? No, I'm looking for the future to see what 
you know, people, of course, I am very familiar with that particular um, two buildings and the people that reside there. So I'm wondering how much we're going to invest to make sure that they're in, you know, they're not that the building is basically crumbling and there's a lot of issues in that, those buildings. So I would just say that for the CDBG dollars the city has that the investment, we're, we are not talking about using these particular funds to, uh, to support renovations in those buildings specifically. However, the Lancaster City Housing Authority has applied for and received home dollars, and they would be potentially eligible to apply for uh, these CDBG uh, dollars. Um, it, but for, we are talking about this particular pool of funding, which is about new units, uh, not existing units. However, I will point back to uh, some of the conversation that's happening federally, which includes an allocation of hundreds of millions of dollars to renovate and repair existing public uh, housing uh, units across the country. And so that's something that we're tracking as well as the additional guidance that we're awaiting from the secretary uh, related to any, uh, any ways that we can be supporting the Lancaster City Housing Authority in maintaining its properties as well. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a distinction to be made about renovation and repair, which is what you're asking about with critical repair. But typically the CDBG dollars are utilized as for our critical repair programs for individual homes and not, in, uh, not entire apartment buildings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from, from the council as a whole? And we will take questions from the public. I see Hi, everyone. Tony. Hi, Tony. Tony Dastro, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. I think I forgot to do that a few times earlier. Um, I think that the engage platform is a good framework for us to like build off of. I can see how it would be a valuable tool if I was a, let's say the city was employing me for public engagement. I would take this with a tablet probably and go door to door and have people filling it out. Um, while 300 people engaging on the engaged platform is an improvement i think we need to all recognize it's nowhere where we need to be and furthermore having a platform i was trying to find it on the city's website actually and was struck i i did manage to find it via a google search but i'm saying right now i was struggling to find it navigating the city's web page on a mobile browser um we really need to do more though because a voluntary survey, while it's definitely pushing things in the right direction, like I said, it's a framework that if somebody was employed by the city going door to door and having people fill out this survey would be valuable. But if I don't have the time to fill out this survey because I have to make money to support my family, if I'm a maybe a second and third shift worker, not really able to make ends meet completely and I'm running out of time to do so, the last thing I'm going to do is check out the city's website to struggle to find uh, the engaged platform and not fill this out. Um, I appreciate the work you do. I'm not trying to totally slash everything, but I think that when it comes to voluntary platforms, we have to take into consideration that not everyone has the time to volunteer even their information in that setting. Thank you, Mr. Daster, for your comment. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the public? Councillor Craig, I have one more question, actually, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Chris, so in looking at new projects for the future of affordable units, so the City Housing Authority created Partners with Purpose with a similar intention of tackling that endeavor. Well, like, what is the relationship? Like, are we also asking them to go through the RFP process? Are we prioritizing the city housing authority in future endeavors of affordable housing units? 
like, I guess I'm trying to understand a little bit better what our relationship is as a city with our housing authority, especially as we tackle new projects. Yes, uh, that's a that's a very good question. And as the mayor mentioned earlier, um, the Partners with Purpose organization, my understanding is that one of the reasons why um, the Housing Authority created that entity is it made them uh, eligible for different pots of funding that they weren't eligible mm -hmm. uh, for uh, earlier as a Housing Authority uh, designation. And so uh, their recent award of the home dollars was the first time that they'd received those dollars uh, through that nonprofit entity. And um, that, that project clearly stood out because of what the city authority is, uh, city housing authority is trying to accomplish. Um, it, in my mind, uh, th they would be a, one of the applicants if they are interested in CDBG dollars as well going ahead. And in fact, that is something that I talked with their leadership about. Uh, we do have to keep in mind that we're still only talking about, you know, a couple million dollars over a period of uh, five years. And really our job is to try to mix and match and piece together all these types of funding in the most successful ways possible. But I do think that CDBG could be a, a piece to that puzzle going ahead. And I guess to kind of clarify a little bit better for me to understand it. So if the city housing authority lies within our purview and like our city government, what is the, the kind of benefits of prioritizing and looking outwardly instead of looking at within our city housing authority for these projects? Well, the city housing authority is not, is independently operated and operates within, so it's, it's, it's connected because we're, it's in the city, mm -hmm. uh, but there aren't any other connections that are related to board appointments or, um, well, that's not true. Um, so, Councilor Garcia Molina, are you asking, are you suggesting that as when we proceed with the RFPs that we are prioritizing partners for purpose, specifically as it relates to the Lancaster City Housing Authority? I just want to un uh, better understand. Uh, basically, yes. So for me, okay. uh, a prime example and not kind of to criticize anyone, but like HC Sim and Atlantic became our partner for the UMC project. I think they're yeah. a great partner, but when it comes to uh, uh, the city housing authority and their ability to look at really that this is their market, they're here, this is all they're due. Yeah. So to me, that's like what I'm trying to understand is like, well, what is our benefit to look outwardly instead of someone who's like hyper-focused? Yes, and HDC does also have longstanding investments and in properties that they maintain here, Duke, Duke Street, Manor, Mulberry, Corner, Mulberry Corners, et cetera. I think one of the distinctions, and I've talked about this recently with um, with Ms. Wilson, who's the executive director, and I, and I believe you've also had a conversation with her, is that there are um, there are different uh, niche uh, ways in which different affordable housing developers approach the actual development of housing. And so really how the Lancaster City Housing Authority is approaching partners with purpose, which is really critical to the long-term uh, success is uh, related to the 95 scattered sites and, and those uh, units which are across the city and to which can be maintained affordable housing in our neighborhoods, which is very different than building and constructing um, as it relates to remember when Claude was going through the process related to all the light tech credits and all of that. So it's just a matter of that in this, in the case of the 250 College Avenue project, HDC was, was positioned because of their history in how they develop affordable housing for that particular site. Uh, and what was going on in terms of the new construction and the way in which that they needed to elevate those to, to construct those sites. In contrast to what Lancaster City Housing Authority, they're both important and they're very different in terms of their strategic um, approach to how they're developing, retaining and sustaining affordable housing over time. And it's not really about, I, I think that that's part of the nuance to this, like Community Basics has a different kind of approach, more similar to HDC, but still slightly different than the Lancaster City Housing Authority. And I also have to give 
major kudos uh, to, Lan to Lancaster City Housing Authority and Barb for her vision mm -hmm. for creating Partners for Purpose and utilizing the HUD tools in order to be more flexible in how they could respond to a growing need uh, for their facilities in terms of um, renovation and how they could get uh, these other dollars. Because home dollars could not go to public authority housing before. But because she created Partners with Purpose as an independent 501c3, now we have the opportunity to provide those home dollars to, the, to that initiative. And so I think it's um, understanding the diversity of the different and the strategy for maintaining, because we have to have a lot of different tools in the toolbox. And Lancaster City Housing Authority definitely has that as it relates to partners uh, with purpose and the scattered sites as it relates to their, their existing facilities. That's like a whole other conversation about uh, the capital needs that they have related to improving those particular properties, which have been underinvested in for many, many years uh, from HUD. And so that's a conversation that we're continuing to have as well. And I'm actually meeting with Barb Leader this week, and I'll, I will bring this up again. And I know it's something that we're an ongoing conversation about how we can best support them. I really appreciate that. That's exactly what I was looking for. I think Great. the potential, I think the potential is really, really interesting. Um, because the community basics and the HDC types of developers, they're purpose built for to create new units. Um, they do some other things too, but those are the projects that we've been talking about. Uh, the city housing authority and partners with purpose, as the mayor said, they're focused on these 95 scattered sites, but depending on what happens with that nonprofit organization. And I don't wanna speak for Barb because we're probably getting out way out ahead of her, but there, there could be potential for an organization like Partners with Purpose or another nonprofit to, to create other units alongside these organizations that we work with. So it's just about having enough players in the network to achieve all these different goals that we're trying to accomplish. Makes sense, appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Xavier. Um, since there are no other questions from the public, I didn't see any. I'll make a motion that we move this to full council on Tuesday. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Super. Um, we will move on then to um, Administration Resolution 20, amending the sewer control plan for Queen and Chestnut Street apartment project. And I know that is Douglas's wheelhouse. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Councilor. It's good to see you all. Um, I have a, a brief presentation, Amber, um, if I might share my screen, just to kind of recap um, where we're at with these and what they are. I hope, I hope that'll be helpful to you. Yep, you should be good to share. Okay, great. Give me one moment. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so the exciting topic of sewer control plan amendments. Um, so these are, uh, this title is used interchangeably with sewer planning module. So just to excuse the lingo here, but um, those are essentially the same things. Um, so what is an official sewer plan? Just for background, all municipalities in Pennsylvania must develop and implement a comprehensive official sewage plan that addresses their present and future sewage disposal needs. So the city of Lancaster um, has one of these and um, there is a process by which they are modified. Um, these plans are modified when new land development projects are proposed or whenever municipality sewage disposal needs change. Um, DEP reviews and approves the official plans and any subsequent revisions. Um, there, this is typically triggered by an increase in uh, sewage uh, flow per day. So 799 gallons per day is typically what triggers them. Um, and this is a, a state requirement that we fulfill uh, per Act um, 537. There are occasionally exemptions that are allowed. So in other words, sewer planning modules would not be, uh, there'd be no need for them to be submitted. And this much, must be approved by both the city and DEP. Projects with on-lot sewage, which we do not have in the city, or uh, projects with available public sewer connections, which we do, are both often exempt from this requirement. 
That changed, however. Um, so in 2017, and uh, maybe Patrick or the mayor know the history here, because this is before me, uh, we expanded our North Pump Station, which provided a lot more capacity in our sewer system. This allowed the DEP to um, permit us to issue a lot of exemptions for developments. Um, between the North Pump Station coming online and November 19th of 2019, uh, we issued a number of exemptions for developments, but in November of 2019, we received a notice from DEP telling us that they would no longer permit exemptions and that we must submit sewer planning modules due to the consent decree, which was no longer in accordance with the clean streams law. Um, so uh, March 2nd of 2020, about a, a year ago, I came before council committee to review this matter with you. And on March 10th, um, you all helped approve the first uh, sewer planning module since February of 2017 for three different projects that evening. Um, and since then, until the present, you've approved eight modules. Um, and tonight's would be the ninth and 10th potentially. So state law does set out a timeline for reviewing these. Um, the Planning Bureau has 10 days to confirm that they are complete, 60 days uh, to act on the, the planning module, uh, including your action, and then 120 days uh, by DEP to um, complete it upon their receipt of the full package that we've approved. Reviewing sewer modules includes first the sewer engineer, that's Brian Harner um, in our wastewater uh, bureau. He evaluates the capacity and existing connections for servicing the site where there's development. And uh, he is really the, um, the person that we rely on most for making sure that the city has capacity. Um, Chief Planner, myself, uh, also helps to complete these um, modules, and I review them for consistency with uh, land use and land development ordinances for the city. And finally, City Council formally adopts a, a resolution to amend the official sewer plan. So tonight's sewer modules, uh, of which there are two, um, the first one is Queen Street Apartments. This is the proposed 11 story, 106 unit tower at Queen and Chestnut. And right now this is under review by the Historical Commission. It's gone to, I believe, two conceptual meetings. And uh, currently I'm not aware of the next date. We anticipate it could be um, this month, but uh, I have not seen the agenda yet, but it should be back in the near future. The next steps there would be um, Traffic Commission, Shade Tree Commission, and ultimately uh, Planning Commission. The second project is Landed Place on King. Uh, this is a proposed seven story, 82 unit tower on the 200 block of West King um, and is currently under land development review. Um, they have a plan submitted to the Bureau right now. And the next step for that project would be Planning Commission. Uh, it has already received approval from Historical Commission um, and I, uh, we do not anticipate any need for it to go before the zoning hearing board. So I believe that uh, those are all the slides that I, I had. Um, I hope that that's a uh, helpful background just to frame the uh, decision that's before you all this evening and as a, as a refresher on the matter. I'm happy to answer any of the questions uh, that you might have. I, I do have one question and I'm pretty sure I asked this before. So we need to amend the, um, the sewer control plan on every existing, that's not right, on every existing um, project that's not new. Well, um, let, you have that partly right. Let me, let me add to that. So uh, if there is a, an existing building that is reused with a higher intensity, say uh, an abandoned warehouse that suddenly has lots of residential units in it, that would probably generate enough sewer flow that it would require a module. Um, if there is a new, a new building, then there typically would be a sewer planning module. Um, all of these are measured against the historical baseline for sewer flows for that parcel. So for, it, for instance, uh, the LNP building at 17 West Vine that is proposed uh, for, for demolition, 
that project um, had significant water use because of the LNP facility that was there, using it for washing the printing presses. Uh, there may not be a need. Um, the, I'm not sure actually yet whether there will be a sewer, sewer planning module for that or not, but it, regardless, it would be measured against the historical uh, sewer flows from that property. So it's not necessarily whether it's a new, prod, uh, a new building or not, but it's the intensity of use for the uh, site. Great. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions from the committee? No? We'll take questions from the public. Going once, twice, gone. Uh, Xavier, we have one in the in the public. Okay, I'm I'm awaiting their arrival. You'll know who it is right away. <laughs> Hi, Tony. It's the gold goose. Now I'm getting goofy. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I just figured, because I actually also don't quite fully Tony, understand Tony, the history. Can I interrupt you a second? Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Sorry. Tony Dastra, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. Um, Douglas, I... I was also around in 2017 a little bit, but I'm kind of confused. Can you explain more about the, like why the DEP wasn't requiring us to submit the, or submit the modules? Like what, what about the new pump station or renovating? I, I just don't quite understand how we were getting the, um, or not having to submit these. Like, could you explain more for me? Yes, I will, I will give that a shot. Oh, sorry, Mayor. Yeah, well, what, you start, Douglas, and then I can fill in. Okay. Um, so once upon a time, we did not have uh, as much capacity in our parts of our sewer system uh, as we needed. And this unfortunately right. led to uh, combined sewer overflows. We, yes. um, as a city, expanded our north pump station some years ago, which provided a lot more capacity in our system uh, such that we um, were not quote unquote over capacity according to DEP. So when, when developments were previously proposed in that sewer shed areas of the city that emptied into the North pump station basin, um, we were having to go through special DEP approvals because we were at capacity. That is no longer the case and we have more capacity in our sewer pipes than we did before. So then the DEP allowed us to start issuing exemptions because they didn't see a need for the planning module since we had just improved our infrastructure. That changed when um, their interpretation of the law changed <laughs> um, when we got our consent decree and they determined that none of our sewer basins uh, were then eligible for planning module exemptions because we were not in conformance with the clean streams law. So um, there is a, a, a section of state code that requires us to be in conformance with that law if sewer module exemptions will be provided. Okay, so if I'm understanding right, then what you're saying is like for this two year period, more or less, the metrics at the time were saying that we were, that we had the capacity to keep adding on and that's why we were able to give exemptions. Yes, and we, we do have the capacity to add on still, and DEP is not contesting that, nor is our sewer engineer. It's just that we are under a consent decree and therefore determined not strictly in compliance with the clean streams law. So these needs, the need for the sewer planning module is not really related to our inability to provide for new development. Um, that we can certainly do. Okay, so it's not even about our our capacity, it's about the consent decree then. Yes, that's that's right. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, sure, and, and I should say, uh, you know, just um, so I'm not at, speaking out of turn here, the um, 17 West Vine Street likely will come for the sewer planning module, but I was just giving you an example of, uh, you know, the use previous and the new use 
um, uh, it's really judged against the historical baseline of a property. So, for sure, I, I totally understand, and I, I appreciate the explanation. Sure, Tony, no problem. Thank you, Tony. Thank Mayor, you, Mayor. Did you have anything to add? Okay. Go ahead, Council Solo. Douglas, just to confirm, when you refer to consent decree, I believe you're referring to the Chesapeake Bay cleanup issue. Yes, um, and the mayor and Patrick and others can probably speak more eloquently on this, but uh, because we are still um, unfortunately spilling untreated sewage into the Conestoga because we don't have capacity to treat the water quickly enough from our rain from storms, um, we are under federal order to fix that problem on a certain timeline. So that's the consent decree that's been issued for the city of Lancaster, as well as um, other communities across Pennsylvania. Thank you, Douglas. I just wanted to, uh, in my mind, compare the two to make sure I was understanding in which degree we were referring to. Thank you. Sure. Perfect. Um, are there any other questions? Comment? Perfect. Um, Council President, at this time, before we move forward, would it be appropriate to do resolution 20 and 21 now? Or um, must I keep them separate? Councilor Craig, I think that you can, um, you know, with the consent of your committee, uh, you can move to add them both to the agenda for next Tuesday. Okay. Um, confer with the committee. Shall we move, put them both together? Perfect. Um, I'll make a motion that we move both resolution 2021 and 2121 to full council on Tuesday. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, was, there, was there a second there? There was, it was Councilor Arroyo. Yep. Thank you, Councilors. Have a great evening. Thank you, Douglas. That concludes community planning for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Craig. Uh, we move then to the Public Safety Committee. Councillor Garcia Molina. Thank you, Mr. President. I believe that our committee is going to be pretty quick. Uh, so we have one agenda item. It's Administration Bill Number 9, 2021, amending Chapter 22 of the Traffic Commission. I see Director Campbell, but I'm not sure if it's Director Campbell or Director Dells, or is it Mayor? It's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, this is a, a change, a proposed change to, um, just pulling this up on my other computer here, um, to, to the uh, ordinance uh, pertaining to traffic commission. And, it would eliminate the requirement that I would serve as a member. Uh, it would allow me to designate one of our staff that's um, already serving as a member uh, as my designee. So much of things related to traffic commission fall into two buckets. Um, if you haven't had the pleasure of coming to, city, um, to traffic commission, they are either around um, speed, uh, which is like the number one thing that people come to traffic enforcement about adding, uh, how do we narrow lanes? How do we add speed bumps? How do we uh, 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 do a speed study? How do we install a, a traffic uh, sign, a stop sign or um, other, uh, other uh, improvements to roadways? So it's engineering or policing. And so typically we've got, uh, uh, we have director Campbell, we have, um, uh, Cindy McCormick, who's the deputy director in engineering, uh, our key lead staff. Uh, Douglas is also a member of the traffic commission. And then we have on the on the police side, uh, we have Chief Bay's designate designee, uh, and uh, which is typically either Lieutenant Laser or Sergeant Luciano. Um, and then we have three members of the public. Um, uh, I'm sorry, two members of the public uh, who have been long time traffic commission members and who are, are, are really uh, great. The third part of this would be basically to allow a third citizen member uh, to uh, be part of traffic commission because I think it would be important. Uh, it's, it's always been interesting to me that traffic commission has been heavily um, administration. And I'm sorry, it also includes you Garcia Molina 
Councillor Garcia Molina as chair of the Public Safety Committee. So it's one council member, which is public, two additional council, or two additional members of public, and the remainder of the the members of Traffic Commission are administrative. And so trying to rebalance this a little bit add in an additional uh, voice uh, from the community. And then also recognizing that for me, this is like way in the weeds. Um, although I do appreciate coming to traffic commission meetings uh, and understanding the issues that are coming up, but they are um, very, very specific uh, to street intersections and speed studies and so on. In addition, this is also the place where Vision Zero is, is going to be fully expressed uh, as we move forward with the implementation of that. That also includes a community engagement um, team that is working to prioritize based on the data, uh, how to uh, generate uh, improvements into our streets to make them safer for pedestrians and bicyclists and cars. And so uh, that's a little bit about traffic commission in general and then the changes that are being proposed in this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I think that's pretty straightforward, makes sense to me completely. Uh, is there any questions from the committee? No. No? None. Any questions from council as a whole? Questions from the public? All right, Amber, let him in. Hey, Tony. Hello, Tony Dastra, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. Um, I am definitely gonna have to read these changes before council next week. Uh, but just off the cuff, like I, I'm a little shocked and I think my gut reaction is just like this upsetness about this because like it, the, the streets of the city, the traffic of the city is one of the most integral parts of how the city functions and operates. And I, I, going to traffic committee meetings in the past, I, they don't work with my schedule these days, which is part of why I just make my statements when I do, when I'm able to. But I thought, I think, I think it was Mayor Gray. I thought he had an intention and a reason for the mayor being on traffic commission. But regardless, this is upsetting for me, especially because over the last four years, we've had conversations about speeding and just how people want to arrive alive like uh, mayor i hope you stay on the council or on the uh, on the traffic commission like i think there's a good reason for the mayor to be on traffic commission and i hope that before council next week your mind changes on the subject i if i am able to make the time in my schedule to come to traffic commission in the future i would like to see you still be there Thank you, Tony. Well, thank you, Tony. I appreciate your concern about how my time is spent on traffic commission. And also, this is not to say that that there can't be that I can't be at traffic commission. It's just providing an opportunity uh, that I am required to be there, uh, which was the same for Mayor Gray and every mayor before them, because this is an, an ordinance that's been, I don't even know, Bernie, you can look it up how, how long the traffic commission ordinance has been in play. But we are trying to be more responsive uh, to the public. Uh, we're working on a variety of things that are at the heart um, from a strategy perspective and a funding perspective to all the cares and concerns that you mentioned, including radar legislation, uh, the, as I mentioned, the Vision Zero plan, our street paving plan, um, uh, changes to the residential parking permit, uh, approach that we make. So it's, this is not to say that the work is not going to continue. Right. I appreciate your response. I, I hear what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. If there are no other questions, I would like to make a motion to move this to uh, full council on April 13th. Second. All those in favor? All right. All right. That concludes my committee, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Garcia Molina. Uh, that brings us to the Economic Development Committee. Councillor Arroyo. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll call to order the Economic Development Committee. Uh, we have one bill today, Bill Number 8, 2021, approving the Downtown Investment District Renewal Plan. Um, and I believe David is in the uh, waiting room for the presentation. Hey, David. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, um, I believe you're here to present on the renewal plan for the downtown investment district. Yes, and is is Bill McCarty also in the waiting room? You may want to bring him in as well. Sorry, what was that name? Bill McCarty. Bill McCarty. William McCarty. Yep. At the bottom there, Amber. Oh, there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chancellor Arroyo and other council members and mayor, thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, we are in the process of, uh, we'd like to uh, institute a new plan. Uh, as you recall, uh, our previous plan was supposed to expire in 2019. However, we came to council uh, one year early in 2018 uh, because the county had just finished their uh, full county property reassessment. And we felt appropriate to be good stewards to our downtown property owners that we came forward and we reduced our millage rate uh, to, be, to show our property owners good stewardship. So we introduced that uh, new plan a year early. Uh, and now we are working under that plan, which expired April 30th of this year. Uh, so what we have looked at over the past year, unfortunately, as most of us have uh, with the COVID-19 we are basically putting in a, like to introduce a new two-year plan, which is basically uh, what we are operating on right now. There's no changes to uh, boundaries. There's no changes to assessment rates, uh, no changes to service. So we want to uh, basically operate for the next two years to really get a good handle on what impacts COVID has had on a lot of our property owners and our businesses downtown before we even think about uh, expansions of our downtown uh, boundaries. And uh, Mr. McCarty, if you have anything to add, uh, going forward. Just some minor background for the new counselors that uh, haven't heard us drone on about this in the past. Um, the authority was created by the city. It's a municipal authority under the State Municipal Authorities Act. Uh, the plan for its services, which it provides, is subject to and must be approved by city council. So that's why we're, we're back at this point with the new plan, which uh, again, does not make any change in the assessed assessment on properties within the district, uh, nor to the nature of the services which are provided. It's been through a public hearing process. Uh, it's been through a notice prior to public hearing through all property owners and by a public notice of the hearing itself. And there's a 45 day period after that hearing, which was held in January, where any property owner can object. And to my knowledge, Dave, no objections were received. No objections were received. Okay. And just so, to highlight, we uh, advertised, we sent uh, letters to every single property owner within the DID. I believe there was 438 individual property owners. Um, they were all invited to the meeting that we had by, by Zoom. That meeting was held on January the 11th. And like Mr. McCarty said, we have not received any objections to the, the plan that was proposed. Great. Uh, thank you both. Um, any questions from uh, the Economic <coughs> Development Committee? Councillor Arroyo, I do have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so in your, your plan highlights, which is very helpful, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that of a total of 788 properties within the investment district, um, 84 of them are tax exempt. So that's government buildings, religious, educational, and nonprofit agency owned properties. Yeah. And one of the areas of opportunity in the plan uh, that you mentioned is outreach uh, to them specifically on engagement and one of those pieces of engagement is payment in lieu of, of taxes. Can you talk a little bit about what you have done in the past in terms of that engagement 
or if there's anything new that you anticipate in this plan period that might uh, be different, a different tactic that you may take. One of the things that we've done in the past, we've sent letters to every single one of our tax exempt property owners. Uh, we have made presentations to our county commissioners uh, for their grant requests. Uh, we want to thank the commissioners very much. They have been very, uh, uh, they've donated every year over the last 10 years that I can recall. Um, and probably at about 60% of what they would have to pay if they did have to pay. So uh, one of our board members is uh, Reverend Tim Metzger from Trinity Lutheran. He and I are setting up meetings with all of the churches within the downtown area to get them to better understand what services we do provide and what benefit it, it brings to their congregation and their properties. So that is one thing that we have not done in the past that we are going to be doing moving forward. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions from the committee? None. Uh, questions from council as a whole? Uh, any questions from the public? Um, there's two hands raised. I'll let the first person in. Hello. Hello. I desire if you can introduce yourself and uh, your street address. They had their hand raised at the end of my last segment. No. Yeah, that hand's been up for a little while. Uh -oh. so if it's in regarding this particular item. Gotcha. Okay, well, we'll move on. Hello. Hey, Tony. If you could introduce yourself and your address. Tony Dastro, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. Uh, actually, not too much of a hard-hitting question. I was just wanting to know um, how quickly I could be directed to this information. It seems to be like it's still publicly available, I think. Um, could I get like a quick routing to this information if I was to look it up on my phone? Is that possible? The, all the information in the proposed plan, um, all of our board members and the current plan that we have are all on the Lancaster City Alliance website. And if you click on the downtown investment district logo, all that information is posted right there. Great. Thank you, Mr. Akili. You're welcome. Thanks, Tony. Great. If there's uh, no other questions, um, I'll motion that we move uh, resolution 8 2021 to full council. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, that concludes the Economic Development Committee. Thank you, Chancellor Rowe. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes the uh, Economic Development Committee, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Councilor Rowe. Um, I believe that brings us to the Public Works Committee. And as if on cue, there is Director Campbell. Uh, Councilor Soto, please take it away. Thank you, Council President. At this time, I bring the Public Works Committee to order. We have one item on the agenda this evening, and that is uh, administration bill number four, addressing personal delivery vehicles. It's an update, and I will turn it over to Mr. Campbell. Mr. Soto. Mr. Soto, if I could interject for a moment, just to say that uh, council acted on this at their February committee meeting. Um, the changes to the uh, the bill that were uh, moved during the February meeting to the full council are only minor. Uh, there's no need for council action. This is simply an update on those minor changes. That, that is correct. And I, and I believe uh, um, the next uh, first city council at the first reading, correct? Yes. This would be first reading on the 13th, but there's no council action necessary tonight since it was already moved at the February meeting. Thank you. 
So um, thank you very much for having me. I wanted to be able to present or refresh people's memory on what uh, may become part of our lexicon going into the future, which is personal de delivery devices or PDDs. These are um, in essence, um, wheeled devices similar to robots, if you will, that allow for delivery of materials, papers, documents, other things um, on, on sidewalks and public rights of way. Um, these are devices that would ordinarily be used by, um, by companies, corporations, universities, campuses, uh, healthcare facilities, uh, et cetera. And the legislation that had been introduced uh, by, um, by the state of Pennsylvania Oh, I'm sorry, may I, I'd like to be able to quickly uh, do a quick presentation um, because I think one of the updates was to be able to show you what these devices actually looked like and how they operated. Um, may I share the screen, Amber? Uh, yeah, you should be able to. Okay. <clears throat> Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, Mr. Campbell. Okay, so um, the intention is to be able to um, uh, find a way of, of implementing the Pennsylvania legisla uh, legislation that had been enacted back in November, which went into effect uh, as of January 31st, allowing these particular devices to use uh, the pedestrian ways, et cetera. These devices are considered, believe it or not, pedestrians. And uh, that is much more so that they are um, not specifically interfering with, with traffic, although they can actually be used on public rights of way of uh, streets that have miles per hour of up to 25 uh, miles per hour. The, the sizes of these devices is anywhere from about 32 inches wide uh, to 42 inches long and can be up to about six, inches, six feet tall, although most of them are usually just about three feet tall. Um, they can go up to speeds of 12 miles per hour on pedestrian ways or up to 25 miles per hour on, on, on public roadways. Most of them really only operate at about three to five miles per hour, which is about a little bit faster than walking than the speed of someone walking. There are a couple of phases for operation and being able to implement them. Um, the, the devices are things that you might be able to see. You know, you see Amazon Prime being delivered. You might see food delivered. You might see documents delivered. Universities would, would use them. Private companies would use them. You might use them if you were to have an app that had access to these devices to deliver things from one point to another point. I'd like to share a very, very brief um, video from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation that tells a little bit more succinctly what they do and how they do it. Let me know if you cannot hear once it starts. Could you turn the volume up, Dr. Campbell? Still can't hear it. I think there's a special setting when you share audio or when you first start screen sharing that you have to click get audio to play.
So there's a basically a two step process for the approval of the use of these devices. The entity that wants to be able to use this, use this device on the streets of any municipality, including that of, of the city of Lancaster, must make their application uh, via PennDOT to the municipality so that uh, the Department of Public Works can review what they're requesting to confirm that it can conform to the specific situations of our street. As an example, they're, they are prohibited from uh, being on sidewalks that are fewer, that are less than 50 inches wide. A preponderance of our sidewalks are, are that narrow or narrower. And so we would be able to have the, the review what they're proposing, the routes that they plan to use, the sidewalks they plan to use, and be able to say, yes, you may do it on these streets. No, you may not do it on those particular types of streets. Once they have submitted and it is reviewed, um, then the authorization, if you will, goes back to PennDOT and, and an authorization is issued. Once an authorization is, I guess I've just described what this process is, they must go to the municipality, um, make the submission, have the review, uh, submit the application to PennDOT, review with us, and then be authorized. After authorization, they, they then have to notify the city, including city council, that this is what they plan to do and how they plan to do it. And that then includes uh, 30 day notice as well as um, uh, indicating what kind of educational campaign they're planning to employ in our community to make us aware of how they plan to use it and how we should interact with it. And they need to be able to declare that they will self-report local law enforcement, any accidents, uh, any damage to property, et cetera, within a 24 hour period of, of any kind of an accident or something like that. This way that we have crafted this legislation was a way to be able to implement or to review the, the work that the law in Pennsylvania state law was imposing on the city, giving us the opportunity to say yay or nay on a case by case basis, whether what was being proposed will work for us or will not work for us. Um, and I think that for the most part, we've been able to successfully put together just such legislation. Are there any questions? I have a, I have one follow up question, Mr. Campbell. When we say restrict, I mean we won't be restricting to all areas, but the areas that will be impeded, if uh, the sidewalk or the pedestrian right away is less than the the size that is recommended by state law. Is that correct? Just so I have it in my mind. Yes, that is correct. They will be similar to many other things that we ask our, our businesses or pedestrians to do. They would submit a proposal saying this is the route that they plan to take. They would indicate if they're using planning to use the sidewalk, which would limit them to no more than 12 miles per hour. We would be saying that particular sidewalk is wide enough, at least for this block or this stretch, or it is not wide enough and therefore we and not authorize them to be able to use this device on that stretch of sidewalk. They might then propose that it be on the roadway, which would mean a different speed, le speed level uh, and a different set of hazards as far as we might be concerned, but we would also then be able to review uh, what are they proposing in terms of how they plan to use the public vehicular roadway as well. And do the if they get denied of any, at any point, do they have a right of appeal, which no matter who the entity is? If they have the right of appeal, I believe it is at the state level, not at our oh, level. Okay. okay. And that being said, uh, how much authority does the state have to overturn uh, your refusal of the certain right of ways that will be impeded? I, th I think that's a good question, but we are the ones who know the quality and the status of our of our streets and our sidewalks. We would we would not be saying that you can uh, have these devices on sidewalks that are too narrow or are uh, would would create major imp impediment to our pedestrians. 
we're very, especially in the spirit of the Vision Zero and the conscientiousness of what we're doing to provide safer streets for pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicles, we're very conscious of how this might impact, in many ways adversely, the ability for people to utilize the streets the way we need them to. We have a high pedestrian traffic um, and very, very narrow streets for a large percentage of the city. And so we're very uh, concerned, if not conscientious, about when and where these devices might be able to be used. Having said that, there are often arenas where they would make a lot of sense, such as on university campuses or on a high school campus or something like that. And as long as they are not impeding the pedestrian right of way, or if there are sidewalks in those areas that are clearly wide enough, we, we would have no reason to say no to those uses in those particular locations. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, because you, you did answer my third question as far as agents, uh, Operation Zero. Uh, are there any other questions from the committee? Are there any other, any questions from the rest of city council? Do we have any questions from the public? Tony Dastra, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. Hi, Tony, how are you? I'm doing well, Mr. Campbell, how are you? Very well, thank you. I appreciate that we are looking at this because I think that everyone, especially after this COVID year, kind of acknowledges the era of automation, including delivery services is definitely impending upon us. Uh, something I think about often, not so much about these delivery vehicles, but related to these services, which is, I would also correlate ride sharing. Um, you know, I, I used to, I sometimes still do Uber around Uber food or people. And I think about how the bus stops could be utilized as, as opposed to just being bus stops, being transit stops that even ride sharing hubs might be able to use to stop at so that traffic flows aren't impeded. Um, but in relation to this, my first, I, I almost started laughing when I found out that they have a speed limit up to 12 miles an hour, just because I know there are some sidewalks um, that will definitely struggle to go 12 miles an hour. Uh, which isn't to strike at this, um, more actually just, are we going forward, if these are on the road, are we at least going to guarantee that like cyclists and other non-motor vehicles are not impeded by these? Um, I do understand that these uh, personal delivery vehicles are regarded as pedestrians, uh, but I, it, just the way they operate, I wanna make sure cyclists still have their literal lane and possibly even these devices could be used to help us slow down traffic flows if they have the right of way in a full traffic lane. So I just wanna make sure that cyclists still have the right of way, they're not gonna be impeded if these are on the road and that uh, basically, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're making sure that cars are the last concern of other vehicles. So these are very, very good questions and the legislation actually does address a couple of them. Um, these vehicles are not to be on dedicated bicycle lanes. They Great. can be on pedestrian roads, they can be on sidewalks, they can be on roadways. I, to be perfectly honest, I'm not 100% clear if they are allowed, I, mean, I believe they are allowed on shared cycling and vehicular lanes, but not on dedicated um, uh, bicycle lanes. Secondly, okay. they, they do need to flow in the direction of traffic. And a, as you can imagine, up to 12 miles per hour is similar is a similar speed to a cyclist on the roadway, whereas three to five miles per hour is, is walking speed or a very, very fast walking speed. Uh, yeah. 25 miles per hour is the, is the speed limit for the vast majority of the roadways throughout the city of Lancaster. Um, right. Part of the regulations, part of what we will be reviewing as each application comes forward is to see to what extent um, these devices in the way that they're proposing them would 
have an adverse impact, not only on our use of the roadways the way we all intend them to, but also consistent with our evolving uh, um, policies re regarding Vision Zero and the safety of our streets. So I think you're, you're asking very, very important questions, which will be evolving. Uh, it'll be evolving uh, regulations, if you will. And that's one of the reasons okay. why we wanted it to be able to come before DPW and not just as the as the state legislation originally implies that you should just be able to put in an application and start using these vehicles willy nilly. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. You're very welcome. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, since we already have it on the agenda for the next week's me uh, first city council meeting of the month, I don't think I need a resolution to move forward. That is that correct? You do um, not know. It's already moved forward. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. And at that at this time, I conclude uh, the public works committee meeting, Council President. Thank you, Councillor Soto. I believe that brings us to the Finance Committee. Councillor Baker. Thank you very much. Um, so on the agenda, we have one item, but we will actually be discussing two items, uh, I'm, I'm guessing probably kind of at the same time. Last month, Mr. Hopkins presented on um, the reasons why refinancing the 2019 uh, note is necessary and advantageous for us. And so we have on the table in front of us two options. One is a bond issue to do that and one is a, a note to refinance. Uh, so I will turn it over to you, Mr. Hopkins to discuss both of those options. Great, thanks very much. Uh, and Amber, could you let uh, Daryl Peck in also? He's in the uh, attendee list. All right, he's on his way. Daryl's probably gonna hide in the background here, but uh, bring him in so he can be part of the discussion. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen um, just to give a, um, let me get to it, there we go. Um, just a little refresh on the financing for the uh, fire station project. And, and when I use fire station project, I really mean the, the two fire stations, the uh, West King Street station that's under construction right now, although quite a lot further along than in the picture that you see here. Uh, and then the East King Street fire station, which uh, should start under construction I believe in July uh, and finish up about a year later is the current anticipated schedule. So the fire station funding sources uh, that we have, we have the, the 2019 note, which had a principal amount of $9,040,000. We've received uh, two RCAP grants for a total of uh, $2 million. The first uh, tranche of that was 500,000 and then we got another total $1.5 million uh, awarded. Uh, this refinancing, our anticipation is that we will uh, be able to produce what I'll call new money of uh, about 1.1 or $1.2 million uh, of additional uh, proceeds from either a uh, banknote or a, a general obligation bond issue. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And then uh, the remainder of the funding that we would need is uh, would come from a reallocation of some savings that we had from the Public Works Operations Center project uh, that was financed, uh, well, across all three funds, the water, sewer, and general fund. Uh, the savings that we have is in the general fund, uh, and I believe that's from proceeds of the 2016 bond issue. So all of those sources uh, in total add up to about well, add up to $14 million. And the need for that funding is uh, basically a combination of the bid uh, results that we got back last year, which total about $12.7 million for uh, the two projects combined. And that is the general uh, construction contract, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, and the fire systems combined are 12.7 million. And then we're adding on to that number $1.3 million of contingency. And really the majority of that contingency is uh, wanting, we wanna establish that for the East King Street Fire Station project. Uh, as I told you back in March, uh, that, pro that project is, we believe either the fourth or fifth fire station to be built on the same property. 
and we're not entirely sure uh, what is underneath the current fire station. And so there's a little extra padding uh, in that budget just for um, you know, the, the potential to need to uh, sort of shore up the uh, underground so that the, the property can be, the new fire station can be built properly and, and will last for decades. So that's the total of the financing, um, a, a current financing, and then this perspective, uh, 1.1 to $1.2 million of new money. So then I wanna to go to a presentation or information uh, that Daryl put together uh, that really does a comparison of the current financing from the 2019 note, and then what we think can happen with a refinancing. So I wanna just direct your uh, attention up here to the, the top right box. And really this is, and I apologize for how small this print is, but I was trying to get everything on a page. Um, so the, the principal amount, as I said, was $9,040,000. And the, that financing with uh, ACNB Bank really had uh, two sets of interest rates. It was a fixed interest rate of 2.82% for the first 10 years, and then a variable interest rate for the second 10 years with a cap of 5%. And so that, uh, and that worked out to a blended rate of about 3.55%. And that's sort of the baseline for the uh, comparison on the refinancing. So what we're, what we're doing here, and I referred to it the last time, is somewhat like a cash out refinancing of a mortgage. Uh, what we're doing is because of lower interest rates now uh, versus back in 2019 when we did this note, we can either do a bond issue or do a, another bank note at a lower interest rate cost, have the debt service schedule be the same as it is now, assuming the cap of 5% for the second 10 years and produce another 1.1 or $1.2 million of new financing out of that borrowing. So instead of having $9,040,000 of proceeds, we would have $10,140,000 or thereabouts of, of proceeds to invest in those two new fire stations. So, and the reason for that is, uh, and you'll see this number here, 2.36%. That is uh, Daryl's current estimate of the true interest cost for the entire uh, remainder of the, uh, the debt service schedule, which would go through 2039. And that difference is really shown here. Uh, so in column two is the existing not to exceed 2019A note debt service. Uh, and you see it ranges from $132,000 this year to about $1.2 million uh, in some of these years. And I'll explain a little bit about why the debt service schedule jumps around like that. And then uh, this is the proposed uh, debt service schedule. And, and we're showing this as bonds, but uh, again, I'll get to it in a sec about the, the possibility of a, a new bank note. And then this would be the, the difference in annual debt service. So in every year, really all but a wash in terms of debt service, but in total about $43,000 uh, lower debt service in uh, combined across the, the years of the, uh, the issuance through 2039. So that amount of reduced debt service, but producing 1.1-ish million dollars of, of new funding. Um, the, this is just the sources and uses of, of funds. And, and obviously this one is much less complicated than others that you've seen because the use of the, pro, of the proceeds is one project. Um, and then you see the, uh, the other uh, costs that are you know, related to uh, bond insurance, the uh, discount, the estimated uh, cost of issuance, which is legal, uh, Concord's fees and, and others, and then just some other miscellaneous fees that add up to uh, this total here. And with the new issuance, uh, including the bond or the proceeds, about $10.5 million. So um, in, in talking through this with Daryl uh, since the March finance committee meeting, um, we think there may be an opportunity uh, that we wanted to at least to investigate through uh, the possibility of both a borrowing uh, with a bond issue, which would just have a set interest rate for the entire uh, term, or uh, the possibility, and we've done this once before, where we also put an RFP out 
uh, to banks to see whether or not we could do this through a bank note. So uh, Daryl's firm, uh, Concord Public Finance, put a, uh, an RFP out uh, last, I believe it was last Wednesday or Thursday, uh, with proposals to be returned on April 19th. So by April 19th, we will know whether or not, well, we'll know one, if we have some proposals from banks or at least a bank, um, and two, we'll know what those numbers look like. And so uh, Daryl can run those numbers uh, and the, the numbers that we're gonna get are about what the interest rates will be. Uh, once we have those numbers, then we can do the comparison of, do we think that the, the bond market as it is at that time uh, can produce a better interest rate for us than the bank note can produce? Um, if we think that's the case, then we would go ahead with a bond auction that would be timed uh, the morning of the second council meeting in April and we'd be proceeding with the bond issue ordinance, which I think is number 10. Uh, otherwise, uh, we would make a decision to proceed with the bank note if we think that is the better avenue to uh, get the, you know, sort of the most bang for our buck. Uh, we would then be per, uh, proceeding with ordinance number 11. So what we'll do here is have, uh, we have both ordinances uh, requested to be added to the agenda for first reading at the uh, council meeting next week. And then uh, depending on which direction we go, we would proceed with one of those and take the other one, uh, but well, just not consider the other one at the second meeting in, in April. Um, just to go on a uh, little bit further along, this is just, uh, again, looking at the uh, annual debt service of the current bond issue. And I talked about, you know, how the, the debt service jumps around. Um, the reason for that is that this debt service was built around all of the other existing debt service that we have in the general fund. And so what we like to do for predictability, for budgetability, uh, we like to have debt service that doesn't jump all over the place. And so we have these, uh, these level bars. And I'll show you this uh, with this graph is the annual debt service for all outstanding general fund debt. Uh, through the, the last issuance that we have that, uh, that expires in 2043. Um, somebody else will be doing that presentation other than me, um, I, you know, fingers crossed anyway. Um, but as you can see, uh, with while the debt service for the 2019 note and whatever this refinancing is, either a note or a bond issue, we'll also have those, those strange jumps in annual debt service. The total debt service all combined is actually quite level. Uh, it goes up to, uh, you know, just over $6.5 million from 2022 through 2029, and then drops down, uh, now down to under $4.5 million for another several years. And as you can see after that, uh, drops down even further. So, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, we're hopeful that we will get some some or at least one uh, solid bank proposal uh, that we have a good comparison to what uh, you know Daryl and his team look at um, you know the prospect of bond issue uh, interest um, and we'll go with whichever one we think is going to produce the most amount of uh, additional proceeds to invest in those two fire stations. So with that, I will uh, unshare this and open it up to any questions that you all might have. Thank you very much. Mr. Hopkins, I do have a question. So obviously either way that we go here, we're gonna end up um, uh, repaying the 2019 note. And there is a note about a prepayment penalty. Can you talk a little bit about how much that is in regards to the full balance? And it, I'm sure that's taken into account that might even be uh, in the issuance cost column, but I just wanted to make sure that's accounted for. Daryl, do you want to jump in there? Because uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, happy to be working with you again here. Uh, if you're looking at a prepayment penalty, there's no prepayment penalty on the 2019 A note. It is prepayable anytime uh, without, without penalty. Okay. Okay, so sorry if that was any word misleading. No, not at all. It probably was just the way I read it, but I wanted to make sure we talked about that too. So okay. Yeah, sure. and uh, Daryl uh, has been in contact with uh, 
representatives from ACNB Bank. So they, you know, they knew it in advance that this was uh, coming. Um, uh, of anybody, banks understand refinancings. Uh, they go through them all the time. Uh, you know, and while this is a uh, pretty pretty quick turnaround on a refinancing, uh, it makes sense to take advantage of the current interest rate market and, um, you know, get some additional funding out uh, and still have our debt service be what we originally anticipated it to be. Thanks, definitely. Are there any other questions from the members of the committee? And from the public, or I'm sorry, from the, the, the council as a whole, I'm jumping ahead. Okay. And from the members of the public, I do see one. You can please add Mr. Dastra. Hello, Tony Dastra, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, because I see that when we're talking about the cost, we have the five major sections, general contract, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, fire systems. I know LMP reported a couple of years ago about a dispute with Wacker Brewing Company. Uh, the newspaper had reported various figures. Uh, so I think one of them was quoted at $200,000. I wanted to know where that dispute is or isn't and to what extent those costs are being factored into the costs we're seeing today. So the dispute is uh, completely resolved. The building uh, that was city owned that was leased by Wacker uh, has been actually long demolished probably a year, uh, maybe more. I'm not sure of the timing of that. Um, so, I mean, that, that was okay. resolved uh, before, actually before the project was bid. Okay, good. And um, j just because I think there may be some disconnect with the public yet, uh, could you detail how that was resolved? Was any mechanism like public or not public, eminent domain utilized? Just what was the resolution procedure like just so the public, if you are able to disclose that information? So this is a memory test because now this is going back into, I think late 2019 or early 2020. I mean, the city had a lease with Wacker Brewing uh, for the use of that city owned property. Uh, the, ultimately what happened uh, was the, that the lease got uh, terminated uh, and there was a uh, payment to Wacker uh, that I, cannot off the top of my head remember what it was. Um, but it was basically to compensate for the loss of the additional years of the, the lease. Okay. I would appreciate if I could get that number later just for my own personal reference. And then, so it sounds like the resolution was like one that was negotiated, like it didn't have to go to court anything, correct? Correct. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Tony. And I do recall uh, that conversation. I believe it was very, very early in 2020. If, but I, that's also reaching back pretty deep in my memory. I mean, last year was a long decade, so. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no other uh, comments or questions from members of the committee, I will hear a motion. Oh, I'm so sorry. I do want to ask how we should proceed with this, Bernie, in that we do have two ordinances. Should we just move both of them forward at this point because the uh, to the 20, is it the 27th? Yes, yes, okay. I think you can both, you can move them both to first, well, their first reading on the 13th, right? Okay, terrific. And then on the 27th, then we'll have a resolution as to which one we're gonna move. Then you'd move forward with one of them, yes. Right, yeah. because uh, like I said, we'll have the, the bank proposals back on April 19th. Uh, you know, within a couple of days of that, we'll have a sense of which direction we wanna go. Uh, mm -hmm. We will let, uh, you know, Bernie and, and everyone on council know that direction and then uh, just proceed with uh, which, either one of the two uh, ordinances we wanna move forward with. Terrific. Then I'll uh, hear a motion to move these to for first reading on Tuesday. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you. And that concludes the Finance Committee meeting, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Baker. I believe that brings us to the Committee of the Whole, um, which is my part of the store. 
Um, so I hereby call the Committee of the Whole to order. Um, first, we're going to deal with Council Resolution um, number 18, 2021, um, which is a resolution supporting the creation of a Lancaster County Department of Health. Before we go any further, I will hear a, uh, I will hear a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, so we, we have a motion and a second. Um, I trust that you all have uh, the text um, of the resolution. And in, in short, um, uh, or a brief background really. So we received a request uh, from Mannheim Township, uh, our colleagues over there. They passed a resolution um, and sent a letter to every municipality in the county um, asking that they do uh, that they do the same. Um, so upon that receipt, I asked uh, Mr. Harris to draft um, a uh, uh, or to to prepare this resolution for us. Um, and he he took their content and added some draft changes, which of course um, I'm very grateful for. Specifically regarding, among other things, uh, the polling data. Um, from the United Way and Franklin and Marshall poll, which shows, as you know, um, that county residents support uh, the creation of a public health department for Lancaster County. Um, they support it overwhelmingly um, when it comes with a small tax increase, and they, a majority of them still support it uh, when it comes with a moderate tax increase. This is clearly something um, that the residents of Lancaster County uh, want. And to, to my evaluation, um, it extends beyond municipal border uh, or, or political party. Um, in, the inter in the interim, um, since we were uh, first received that email, uh, it's my understanding that the boroughs of Denver and Columbia have also passed uh, similar similar resolution. So I'm looking to move this forward to next Tuesday and, and add our voice to the chorus of voices <clears throat> acknowledging that Lancaster County residents do want a public health department, not just to respond to the issues presented by uh, COVID-19, but to the myriad health tasks which are present in our county. Uh, food inspections, uh, lead paint um, in houses, uh, which is something that the city is tackling uh, admirably, I, I might add. Um, but we, we can see, uh, I think, the value um, and the impact of the lack of central, of central health leadership in our county throughout the past year in this, in this pandemic. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, are there any uh, questions or comments from, the, from members of the committee, which is all of you? President Smith Whitehall, I would just echo your sentiments. There's obviously a demonstrated need for a centralized health department in the county. Um, 2020 has certainly shown us that we don't live on an island. And any time where we can agree uh, with uh, with folks in Denver on something, <laughs> certainly means that it's important. It's important enough that we all need to get behind it. So I wholeheartedly support this. Excellent. Um, are there any questions or comments uh, from the public? Should have known. Um, please add Mr. Dashner to the meeting. Don't you know that I have to comment on everything? You should have known. You're right. Tony <laughs> Dastra, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. Um, no, I just wanted to comment and basically say the same, which is, you know, I'm glad to see there's some movement on this. And I think it's necessary for our county to take such action. Um, this was a conversation that I know was had even before COVID hit. So I'm grateful that Mannheim Township is reaching out to other municipalities. I think, I think going forward, not just on this subject, but there's a whole myriad of issues that we can start uh, cooperating in an intermunicipal manner and getting a lot more done because our county leadership isn't necessarily doing the things we need them to do until push really, really comes to shove someone off a cliff. Um, and we need to do a lot more work in between our own governments as small as 
very small local governments to try and push our county to make the right moves that we need. I don't think anybody's doing it out of malice. I just think it's, um, you know, a, a way of being and a work even you one could even say this, it's even a worry about creating more big government. But I think that something we need to recognize about our American society is that capitalism isn't necessarily taking care of the woes when it comes to healthcare. And if we're a society committed to ensuring people are healthy, we need to let the government have a level of of governance in this to ensure the well-being of our communities. I appreciate you guys for putting this forward and voting on it next at the next council meeting because it's definitely something I support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dastro. All right. If there are no additional comments, um, I will go ahead. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, All right, are there any nays? Okay, um, so we'll be dealing with this one uh, at the next meeting of, uh, at the first meeting of council in April. Um, that brings us to council resolution uh, number 19, 2021, um, which is one I'm really excited about. Uh, oh, Mr. Harris, do I see a concerned face? Is that the, yep. oh, okay, cool. I try to watch Mr. Harris's face because that's how I know whether I'm, uh, whether I'm on track or not, sorry. Um, uh, council resolution number 19, 2021, which is one I'm excited about. Uh, and this would declare, um, I'm sorry, did we correct, uh, did we correct this? Was it April 13th? We did. Yeah, which would uh, declare April 13th as Buddy Glover Day in the city of Lancaster. Um, uh, so first we'll start, uh, I would love to hear a motion. With all my heart, I approve. Second. All right, I've got a motion and a second. Thank you, Councillor Soto and Diaz. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to keep this brief. Um, there is nothing I can say about uh, Buddy Glover that has not already been said. Um, the man was a force. And anytime we have the opportunity uh, to recognize a Lancastrian, particularly somebody from Lancaster's uh, Southeast um, for a lifetime of commitment to our most important resource, our children, um, I believe that we should, uh, we should take it. Um, so again, thank you to uh, Mr. Harris for uh, drafting this uh, for drafting this resolution, and a special thank you. I think he'll be with us uh, next Tuesday uh, to Mr. Jamil Thrash um, for providing uh, content um, and and sharing with us, um, you know, uh, memories and and notes from his uh, family's relationship with and remembrance of. Uh, of Mr. Glover. Um, so we, uh, we hope to, to recognize him on the 13th, which is the day of his birth. Now, unfortunately, we won't be able to pass this resolution until the evening of his, uh, of his birthday. Um, and I, I don't want to call a shot, but I, I have a strong belief that this resolution is going to pass uh, unanimously. So I, I'm going to encourage everybody to go ahead and treat the whole day uh, as, as Buddy Clover Day. So um, with that, are there any, um, any comments from the Committee of the Whole? Council President, may I? Please. My relationship with Mr. Glover goes back to my senior year in high school. We met plenty often in his office, but I should have been where I shouldn't have been. <laughs> many, many years later, I got the privilege to work with him when he was assistant principal McCaskey and I was working in the facilities department. His, uh, his caring, his love for students, his belief that anyone and everyone can move forward in life and do better for themselves in the community will always stick with me. And I 
truly remember him always. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilor Soto. Are there any comments from the public? I'm going to, I'm going to, with your indulgence, I'll be a member of the public right now uh, about Mr. Glover. Um, Please. It sort of pains me to think about this, but it was 40 years ago. So 1981, uh, when Mr. Glover and I don't remember the other assistant principal, but they would walk the streets of all of Lancaster City, all of Lancaster Township, and welcome the family and the kids of every incoming freshman in McCasker. Well, at, at my sophomore at, at McCaskey when it was only 10, 11, and 12. Uh, and I'll never, I mean, I still vividly remember that day when he came up, knocked on our door, and I stood out on our front porch with my father, talked to him about, you know, I had a little bit of a jump start because I had competed for a year at sports at McCaskey, but um, that really stuck with me. And the fact that he did that year after year after year, uh, wearing out those black Converse high tops that he wore um, is really just there. Like how good of a person can you be uh, to do that every year for, for decades? Um, just has a huge impact on, on kids, on families. Didn't matter where in the city or where in Lancaster Township you lived, uh, he was there. Great man. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Um, Ms. Strazo, please add Mr. Dastra to the meeting. One more time. One more time, but not the last time. Tony Dastra, 700 block of New Holland Avenue. Well, hopefully the last time tonight, I suppose your agenda has come to an end. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for recognizing not just a community member, but a McCaskey educator in this way that I feel deserves this recognition. Um, as I kind of touched on, I guess it was a week or two ago at this point, uh, I have had less than positive experiences with some of the educators at McCaskey, specifically one. Uh, and I think to, as a young person especially, to be able to know the name of somebody who is a positive impact or was a positive impact in this community, clearly to the extent that Mr. Hopkins is even speaking praises of him today. I think that's notable. I think it deserves recognition. And I will be very glad to celebrate Buddy Glover Day next week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dastrick. Okay. Um, I believe... Uh, we have, we have worn this meeting as much as we can wear it. Um, and so with that, uh, having a motion and a second, um, uh, uh, sorry, having a motion and a second um, to move this item uh, to next Tuesday's council meeting. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, I'll do this by acclamation again. I didn't ask for your permission the first time, Mr. Harris, I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> But uh, all those in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? Aye. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Um, all right. <laughs> if we're all eyes and no nays. Uh, that's been moved. And that brings us to the end of our agenda uh, for this evening. Mr. President, if I may. Of course. Um, there was one um, resolution that was added earlier today that yes. would also go to the Committee of Whole. So that would be, uh, and due to that resolution being added, um, it re renumbers slightly. So this would be resolution 22, which is a resolution concerning recognition of April 2021 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Thank you. I think I'm working from a prior version of the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Um, so we do have, um, we do have a resolution recognizing uh, April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, before we move forward, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Um, this item was proposed by Councillor Diaz. Councillor Diaz. 
Thank you, Mr. President. As we know, April is the Sexual Assault Awareness Month and April 2021 marks the 20 years since the officially began. Now, it's a, probably something that people don't talk about because they're afraid of speaking out, but sexual assault is an ex unacceptable crime and it's important to take steps to put an end of it. There's about each year 321,000 men and women that report sexual assault. However, there's also many cases which go unreported. Survivors can find it difficult to talk about for many reasons. You know, they're either feeling shame or guilt or fear. And it's really important for us as council people to um, make sure that we resonate and speak out against it. And of course, COVID-19 also has brought a lot of people insecurities in being able to get out. And some people don't realize that also sexual assault can also come through social media, whether it's a phone call, a tax, or something that, um, you know, can automatically show up at your, you know, in your email. So we really need to prevent that as well and make sure that we report it. And that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Dia. Um, are there other council comments on this important resolution? I do, Mr. President. <clears throat> Please. So, uh, Back in 2018, 2019, I was actually a sexual assault counselor at the YW. And I think that was both the most rewarding job and the most taxing. Here, our community is not exempt from sexual violence. Uh, we had clients young as three, four years old, all the way through the gamut. Um, and right now too, with the way that COVID has impacted social services, our SAPC team at the YW has really stepped up to the plate to really adapt and meet those needs that, as Councillor Diaz said, has not gone away just because we are in a virtual world. Uh, so I'm really glad that Councillor Diaz brought this forward so that we can continue to bring awareness. Uh, it's one in four women and one in six boys that experiences sexual assault during their lifetime. So you never know who you're encountering. You never know their stories. And as we like move forward to becoming a trauma-informed community, I think this definitely needs to be centered in those conversations. So I'm really grateful to you, Councilor Diaz, for bringing this forward, as well as to council as a whole for really prioritizing this effort in our community. Thank you, Councilor Garcia Molina. And yes, indeed, thank you, Councilor Diaz, uh, for bringing this forward. Um, I am going to, uh, if there are no other council comments, um, I'm going to go ahead and, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, being that we have a motion in a second with no other council comments, um, let's go ahead and do this one by acclamation as well. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? All right, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Harris, I'm gonna check in with you one more time. Does that in fact conclude our legislative agenda for this evening? That concludes our legislative agenda, Mr. President. All right, if you don't mind, um, I believe all counselors have a copy of your clerk's report. Do they do, yes. Yes, all right. Um, uh, do you mind if we uh, forego that this evening given the hour? I do not mind whatsoever. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, as I said earlier, I think we have worn this meeting as much as we can wear it. So I would happily hear a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. All right, I have a motion and it sounds like a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. all right. Thank you everyone, we are adjourned. Have a good evening. Good night everyone and God bless. Aye. Aye.